Just a few minutes now, we'll start the show. You're listening to Storm into Whitby by Pleated Gazelle. Welcome to Sundays with Dracula. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. I'm going to miss saying that every week. This is chapter 27 of Sundays with Dracula, the last chapter of the book. And it's also Bram Stoker's birthday today, born on the state in 1847. If he yet lives as one of the undead, he's 173 years old. So be kind to him if he visits you at night. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach in Philadelphia, the home of Bram Stoker's Notes for Dracula, over 100 pages of outlines, early plot ideas, and research notes compiled by the author over the seven years he developed and wrote the book. It is an extraordinary record of the conception and development of a novel. We'll see something from Stoker's notes today, a passage at one of my favorite notes in the entire book. I'm happy to share that today. And joining me today to talk about the last chapter is the award-winning broadcaster, writer, educationalist, and cultural historian, Sir Christopher Frayling. Christopher, welcome. Hi there, Edward. It's great to be here. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy you're here. And we literally have an audience around the world, people tuning in from Brazil, uh, from, from England. Uh, Niels and his wife, uh, Lizata, I think, is, is tuning in from the Netherlands. Um, so it's a, it's a nice crowd today. For everyone in the audience, Sir Christopher Frayling is the author of many books, including The Yellow Peril, Dr. Fu Manchu, and The Rise of Chinophobia. Frankenstein, The First 200 Years, and Once Upon a Time in the West, Shooting a Masterpiece. His 1996 Nightmare, The Birth of Horror television series, which, uh, which I have the accompanying book here, which is one of my prize books in my collection, uh, feature the origin stories of Frankenstein, Dracula, Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. And he also visited the Rosenbach for the Dracula episode. His vampires, Lord Byron to Count Dracula, was a landmark cultural study of vampires when first published in 1978. And an updated edition was published in 2016, Vampires, Genesis and Resurrection, From Count Dracula to Vampirella, 
Christopher, I have all your books. So um, uh, I'm happy and honored to have you on the show today. That final picture is just wonderful on the, on the latest edition. We got a painting by Lord Leighton, the great Victorian, rather innocent Victorian painter. And we thought, just have the neck. And, just show uh, the neck. I love that design. And originally, we were going to have two holes in it with red boards underneath it. But we thought that was a little bit cheesy. <laughs> just the neck. Well, it's hard to go cheesy with vampires, right? <laughs> so um, I, uh, I'm, I'm so happy you're doing this today. And apparently you are going to be uh, doing a Philadelphia interview two weeks in a row. Really? Uh, Pat, Patrick Rogers. Is oh, yeah. He's in, I didn't know he was in Philadelphia. He's in Philadelphia. Yeah. I didn't know where they're coming from. Oh, that's fantastic. I I'm know, Patrick. And, um, uh, and I have... Room. Yeah, he, he's wonderful interviewer, and he's done some great interviews with people on a, on a show he was doing that was once on Amazon. Now he just posts them to his uh, YouTube page, and it was um, it's called "Interviewed by a Vampire." <laughs> and uh, he interviewed um, James Burke from Connect from Connections fame. He right. interviewed um, uh, oh a couple uh, an astronomer from Philadelphia, Derek Pitts, Kyle Cassidy, the photographer. So he's he's got a really great show, and he's going to have you on next Sunday. Uh, Steve is going to share the link for everybody today so you can all watch the replay um, because you're going to watch Sundays with Dracula next week for our after show. Then you can watch the replay of the Sir Christopher Frailing interview with Patrick Rogers. But I have a question today from Patrick for you when I do a little questions in a minute. And uh -huh. he is going to ask you a question from me next week. So All right. Okay. Very good. All righty. But first, Christopher, I'm, I have to, uh, I, we have a cocktail every week on this show. Um, I've had, this is the 27th cocktail, Dracula inspired cocktail we have had on the show. And uh, late in the game, I wound up getting a, a cocktail sponsor uh, and that's Tamworth Distilling. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix my drink and I'm gonna tell people about this uh, delicious uh, drink that I'm making today. And I'm calling this cocktail, of course, because it's Bram Stoker's birthday. The drink is gonna be called Bram's Birthday. And it is a champagne cocktail because that's a very celebratory kind of drink to have. It's a champagne cocktail and I'm making it with this apple crisp from Tamworth Distilling uh, for their apple. It's, it is a, uh, a apple brandy flavored with maple syrup. And they take the maple syrup right from their Tamworth land up there in New Hampshire and they combine it with 100% New Hampshire apple brandy. And the result is a lower proof sipper with deep flavors reminiscent of warm mulled cider and an aroma of rich dark grade syrup and a sugar shack. And I'm just gonna have a sip right now just because it's delicious and then I'll make my cocktail. Wow, it's really nice. And you could really just sit, oh, oh, it's really good. I mean, it's got this, and it's sweet. And I love, you know, I have a, everybody on the show, Chris, who knows I have a sweet tooth. Like almost all my cocktails have some kind of sugar in them. And, uh, uh, and oh, it's absolutely delicious. I, I encourage all of you. But for the drink, I'm going to use this little uh, champagne glass and I put a little sugar in it on the bottom. And then some bitters. I like the Peugeot's bitters best. And I put those on top. And then just about a shot of apple brandy. Now pour that in. And then the champagne. And it's not actual champagne today. It's just California champagne. So that's what that's what the budget allowed for today. <laughs> there's no there's no Tamworth budget for my champagne. And I'll add the champagne, which is great. And then actually let's move this for a sec because then I like to have a little effect going on with it. And I'll use I use this spoon and I take a little port wine and I put it in a little uh, container to make it easier to pour. And I'll give that a little drizzle there. Gives it a nice little swirling effect in the drink that will easily go away as I drink it. So, and I'm calling this Bram's birthday and you can't have a birthday drink without a cherry in it. So there we go. 
So cheers, Bram Stoker, on your birthday. And thank you for this wonderful novel, wherever you are. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to. That's and that's a little glass. That was my worry today that I'm making it in a little glass and I'm going to have to make a couple more of these as we go on. I was going to add something else to it. And it tastes too good to add. I was going to put a little half shot of, uh, of Irish whiskey in it to honor Bram's roots, but it's actually so good. I'm not going to touch it. So um, there'll be two different versions of this you can have. One one has a, uh, a little bit of Irish whiskey in it. So um, I'll post this uh, recipe on our website and you can buy apple crisp um, at Tamworth from Tamworth online if they deliver to you, but not all states in this country have, uh, law, have allowed delivery within state. But if you're in the Philadelphia area, you can get it at Art in the Age in Philadelphia. And I wanna thank Tamworth and Art in the Age for assisting me with today's cocktail. Christopher, this is what I've been doing for six and a half months. I've been drinking and smoking my pipe and talking about Dracula. So <laughs> you're, you're witnessing either, either, either the greatest thing I've ever done or my demise. Um, the, uh, we, we have, um, when we've had special guests on and when I have, uh, I, I do, we do another little show called Monday Drac Chat, which is like an after show of this with the audience comes on. I always ask everybody, what's their Drac, what's your Dracula story? Meaning, when did you first come to the book and how did you first get involved in reading it and all of that? So what's your Dracula story? Right. Well, I don't know if you can see this. Um, this is a paperback edition of Dracula, which I read when I was 10 years old. Wow. And the picture on the cover completely obsessed me. It scared the pants off me. And I, and I was at a boarding school in the English countryside and I used to sit underneath the blankets with a torch late at night, quite illegally. I wasn't allowed to read that late. And in fact, I had this book confiscated from me. <laughs> I was caught one night. So that was a trauma in itself. That was my first introduction. My second is very bizarre. I was studying uh, when I, uh, later on when I was 15 or 16, I was studying the French enlightenment in the 18th century. And I read all about the epidemic of vampirism that occurred in on the outer reaches of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in sort of 1728 through till about 1740. And all the French philosophers piled in, Voltaire, Rousseau, Diderot, all these famous philosophers, trying to explain what the hell was going on in Eastern Europe. You know, it, it was uh, uh, um, one person bites two people, bites four people, but it's like a plague, like an epidemic, mm -hmm. like a pandemic. And how did they try and deal with it? They uh, cut people's heads off and dug them up after death and stuffed garlic in their, the trunk of their neck and all sorts of things. And the philosophers were very exercised by this. And I thought, that's really interesting, you know, that this, it came through kind of legitimate philosophical history. Voltaire said, oh, it's all rubbish. It's just the priests trying to get people to go to church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it, it don't believe it. Rousseau said uh, rather subversively, Look, there's just as much evidence for this as there is for miracles. <laughs> so either you believe both or you believe neither. This got go. them very upset. Anyway, I was Rousseau really stirring the pot <laughs> in, in my teens and, and, and at the same time went to see the Hammer films, Christopher Lee and so on. But it was this illustration on this book, that, yeah. which is completely inaccurate because, of course, in the book, he's supposed to look like an elderly military yeah. commander with a moustache and all the rest of it. Here he looks, I don't know, he's sort of post Lugosi and pre Christopher Lee, you yeah, know? kind of a combination uh, of them. What's that publisher? It's Arrow Books, and Arrow it came Books. out in the in the mid fifties. And one thing they get wrong is they just give him upper canine teeth, you know. And I've always thought, as I in my nightmare series, I tried to point this out with much uh -huh. hilarity, that you're supposed to have lower canines as well, so you can get the skin. I don't want to get too detailed about this. Get the skin <laughs> in between your teeth. Yeah. If you just have the upper set, you go. Mm sink your teeth in and you can't get them out, which would be very undignified. So yeah. although it's inaccurate, it scared the pants off me and uh, got me into big trouble reading this book. So like all guilty pleasures, it became particularly attractive because it was banned. But when then later you, you said when you were studying and, and you were coming across these, these accounts, this is before there was any serious academic study of Dracula or just vampires in general, right? Oh, it's true. When I, when I wrote the first edition of Vampires, uh, I, I researched it uh, in the early 1970s, 
when I was a research student at Cambridge studying Rousseau, actually, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And you went to the reading room in the old British library, the big round reading room. And I'd ask for these books and they'd, they'd sort of wince and, and, and bring these books to me wearing white gloves and put them down as if the books had some sort of play associated with them. Nobody in those days was studying the Gothic. It was completely out of fashion. You know, realism was the thing. Yeah. You studied in the novel, you studied Dickens, you studied D.H. Lawrence, you studied all these realistic writers, but fantasy of all kinds, and particularly the Gothic, was completely out of fashion. So they were amazed in the British Library that I wanted to see this stuff. Now, if you go to the British Library, there's no one who isn't studying the Gothic. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every research student, every young literary scholar, you know, every freelance is studying Gothic literature. So. The worm has turned, so to speak, in the last yeah. half century. But no, it, it felt very odd, actually. And, um, and people would sort of turn up their nose and say, why do you want to study that stuff? You know, it was sort of um, not quite part of the first 11, as we call it, the first division. Uh -huh. uh, and, and Mary Shelley wasn't in the first division. Yeah. Bram Stoker wasn't in the first division. Too, yeah. we, have a, we have a couple of Gothic scholars on our show, uh, Dr. Lauren Nixon and Mary Going from Sheffield Gothic. Uh, they're, they're two of my co-hosts that come on this program. Uh, there's a hello here from Elizabeth Fuller, our librarian. Uh, she says she's been rewatching Nightmare, remembering your visit to the Rosenbach. Nice to see you again. Thank when you. you visited the Rosenbach, um, I guess it was 95-ish or so, because the series That's came right. out in 96, That's yeah? Right. Yeah, or well, maybe 94, but anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that like to be one of the first, you were wrote, you were one of the first, you know, scholars to come and study Stoker's notes and certainly the first one to put it on, on, you know, film. Um, yeah. Well, I'd read in a footnote somewhere about the Rosenberg collection. So I came over in 93 and had a look. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to do much more than spend an afternoon just sort of looking through it. So when I put up the idea of nightmare to the producers, I wanted a section in each of the programs where you went back to the manuscripts so that uh, you'd go to the Rosenbach for Dracula, you'd look at the manuscript of Frankenstein in the Bodleian Library, which is in Mary Shelley's handwriting, Mary Godwin's handwriting. Mm -hmm. You'd look at uh, the surviving pages of The Hound of the Baskervilles and the manuscripts in Edinburgh. That was to be a key part of the program, getting back to the sources, the real physical sources of these things. And so I persuaded them to do this filming in, in the Rosenbach. The Rosenbach were very accommodating. So I could go in and pretend I hadn't seen them before. So I'd open it and say, oh, look, look, there's Whitby. Actually, yeah, I'm film. That's what you got. You're, you're acting as well when you're presenting. That's showbiz. Right? That's showbiz. But um, no, it was great and had a big reaction because, as you say, it wasn't that well known then. We had the exterior, you know, white, a yellow cab pulling up and I get out and I go through the door and uh, open up the, the manuscripts and have a look at them. And it became the sort of organizing device for the whole episode, in particular, the notes uh, that he took on Jonathan Harker's visit to the castle with the three vampire brides. This well, that's, what I was, that's, that's what I'm going to ask you next. What's your, what do you think was the most interesting part of the notes? Is that it? I found that, I, I found that you know, going back to 1890, where he does his first very uh, rudimentary notes, um, there's one thing that keeps coming up right from the very beginning. And he goes back, one of the very few things that exists in 1890 and was still there in the novel in 1897, seven years later. And that was, Apart from going to Eastern Europe, it was Styria to start with, like in Carmilla, not Transylvania. But one thing that was there was this scene where Harker is seduced by the three vampire brides. The Count comes in with blazing eyes and says, this man belongs to me, I want him, and tears him away. And mm -hmm. that appears in the very first notes that he took yeah. in the spring of 1890. Well, your earliest dated notes, at least. Exactly, earliest dated. The earliest date we have on the notes. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I kind of thought, well, you know, there's a, a family legend amongst the Stokers that it originated in a nightmare, uh, possibly after eating uh, uh, some bad dressed crab salad at one of these uh, dinners at the Lyceum. And he had this terrible, as you do with seafood sometimes, he had this terrible dream. And I suddenly put two and two together. And I thought, well, if he did have a nightmare, this was probably it. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting nightmare because it's a seductive one all these wonderful vampire brides getting closer and closer and you can feel their breath on your yeah. neck and One tries to kiss him not on the lips absolutely and, 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 and Harker's lying there thinking i quite like this no i don't no i don't oh, oh i do actually etc and then in comes the count this man belongs to me so it's a kind of tug of war mm -hmm. over harker and his sexuality and i thought 
that to Stoker would be a real nightmare, you know, not quite knowing who he belongs to. Yeah. So I took that as, as, as a really interesting starting point. And that became the organizing device, really, for the whole episode where we begin with Stoker's nightmare and yeah. then unpack it for the next 50 minutes. So, yeah, that was it. That was in the Rosenbach. I mean, the notes are fantastic. You know, there's so few authors where you've got so many wonderful clues as to yeah. what was on their mind as you get in, in, in that. Um, uh, and, and it just shows, I think, how little people rated Stoker in his lifetime. I mean, if you think of most authors, the widow of the author would make sure that the notes found their way into some piece of the literary establishment in order to establish the posterity of their late husband to get the archives sorted. You know, the famous literary widows of history, they make absolutely sure that their late husband gets into the archive, gets into the canon. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Stoker goes straight to the auctioneers and flogs the lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that showed that, you know, they weren't thinking of him as a serious author that belongs in the British Library, that belongs in, you know, the Society of Authors. They think this is, this is stuff, I might make a few bobs selling it. And that's very indicative, I think, of yeah. the esteem. When, when Stoker died, you know, um, I've looked closely at all his obituaries, they scarcely mention Dracula. Mm -hmm. They mention Henry Irving, you know. Henry for whom... Irving, yeah, that's what he'll be remembered by. The obit and, the and, and the fact by. that he had, quote, a genius for friendship. That this man was very, very good at networking, you mm -hmm. know, at, uh, which is why he was so useful to Irving, and uh, and and those, and then maybe in a little line, oh, he also wrote that shocking novel, Dracula. Now, of course, you wouldn't mention anything else. It's the lead, yeah. But uh, so the notes are interesting for lots and lots of reasons, and great that it ended up in an institution where scholars can consult it and not locked in some vault. Uh, in some private collector, not letting people to go. That's great. That Anybody can... can come and look. You don't have to be a credited scholar. You don't have to be making a documentary for, you know, the BBC. You can just- <laughs> And also, and since you published this wonderful facsimile with transcriptions and everything, yeah. you can do it at home. Yeah. Which is great, which is great. I have, uh, if anybody has a question, uh, please ask. I'm going to ask you the question from uh, Patrick Rogers today and his, uh, uh, and that who will be interviewing you next week, an interview by a vampire. Patrick's question is this. In your book, Vampires, you describe Polidori's The Vampire as probably the most influential horror story of all time. And he yeah. says, you discuss other vampire stories in folklore that predated and in some cases influenced Stoker's work. Of the lot, why is it that Stoker's Dracula has more name recognition than any vampire before or since? Well, it's a great name. And I think Stoker mm. realized that, you know, yeah. that uh, the book... In the notes, the early notes, he's called Count Wampire. Yeah. And you think, if this book was called Count Wampire, would we be talking about it tonight? <laughs> I doubt it. And then he finds this book when he goes on holiday to Whitby, and uh, here's this uh, uh, William Wilkinson, an ex-ambassador, mm -hmm. uh, Count of the Principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia, and he just sees this footnote, Dracula. And he writes down the name. He doesn't really understand its significance yet, and, and he certainly doesn't know as much about Vlad as has subsequently been claimed, he just has this footnote and he writes Dracula. So at the last minute, he changes the title yeah. of the book from originally Count Wampart, then The Dead Undead. Yeah. And on, the, on the typescript sent to the publisher, it's still called The yeah. Dead Undead. And then he's, nah, let's call it Dracula. Great piece of branding, great piece of branding. And um, I mean, the reason I call Polidori so uh, significant, I think, is because I mentioned these vampires of the 18th century. They're in rural societies, they're all peasants. They're just as likely to bite sheep and cows as they are their own relatives. Uh, and what's, what Polidori does is he propels the vampire into the world of counts and countesses, of aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And he plays to this idea of the aristocracy being a kind of bloodsucker, you know, that the rest of us are drained by contact with these charismatic aristocratic people like Lord Byron. Yeah. So, in a way, Polidori sets the rules for mm -hmm. the whole of the 19th century. Stoker tinkered with the details, but by then the die was cast. They're counts, they live in remote castles, they bite young people in the case of uh, Polidori, uh, you know, it's a young man called Aubrey, um, but he's doing it from nothing. I mean, he's doing it from folklore to literature. So mm -hmm. in that sense, I think Polidori uh, set the rules that were very difficult to shed throughout the 19th century. Of course, today, post Stephen King and Anne Rice, the devil is in the central heating unit, you know, he's not in the castle. And that's all changed. It's all much more democratic now and it's in everyday life. But in the 19th century, they're all counts and countesses. Yeah. If you're French, it's a countess. 
if you're English, it's a count. <laughs> and for some reason, it's, it's gendered in that way. But uh, um, no, I, I think it's very fair to say, for that reason, he is the most significant of all those books of the 19th century. And nobody had heard of him, Polidori. And the book's called yeah. The Vampire with a Y, which isn't an awfully catchy title, but uh, there you go. It went through a lot of editions. It did, yeah. And, more and, than Frankenstein. And, and more than so popular before Stoker. I mean, it's, it's the most popular... It's the most well-known vampire story before Dracula. Yeah, and of course, everyone thought it was by Lord Byron, which helped its sales. <laughs> so I have a question here from uh, Lockie Heiss. Uh, Lockie saw you at the Polidori conference at the Keats House. Oh, yeah, in London. Yeah. Keats House conference on Polidori. And he just wanted to know if there were any news or updates about either Stoker or Polidori since that conference. Well, I've been in correspondence about the way that Polidori died and whether he did commit suicide or whether this was a canard put out by Byron, yeah. that poor old Polidori, having been mocked and patronized in his own lifetime, wasn't even allowed the dignity of a dignified death. And they immediately said, oh yes, the, the doctor committed suicide. And one of the people who was there had a lot of medical knowledge and he's been in correspondence with me. I Polidori... think that's Lockie himself. I think that's who's asking. Ah, him. sorry, I didn't get the name. Well, that's fantastic. In that case, I owe him a, a huge debt because he's put in my mind the idea that Polidori fell off his carriage a couple of years before, bumped his head, mm -hmm. and a lot of the symptoms that he was showing in the years before he allegedly committed suicide are congruent with someone who's bashed his head and has brain damage. Yeah. Um, in which case, he may well have died from natural causes, as the coroner thought, and not committed suicide, as Byron put around. And I found that interesting. Um, yeah. Apart from that, oh, sorry, yes, I should have known that. But I think Lockie's been in our audience since the beginning, and he's and he does the Polidori work, and he does a lot of work with Emily Girard too. So I guess he was saying we had a long chat about Emily Girard yeah. and uh, Transylvanian superstitions and the land. We we we, we sat in a restaurant in Hampstead near uh, uh, the Keats House and uh, amused the passers-by by discussing the land beyond the forest. <laughs> it happens to all of us. The, um, I have a question here from Adrian, too, from France, Adrian Party, um, uh, who may have interviewed you before in the past. He's interviewed lots of people uh, doing vampire work. He says, having worked on vampire literature, on vampire before literature through folklore and the way an author like Dom Augustum Calmet uh, mm -hmm. recollected anecdotes, how do you explain the shift to fiction literature, you know, from from these folk tales, and and then other references too, and then into fiction. Yeah, well, I think as so often the poets got there first. You know, you've got Goethe, you've got Keats, you've got Coleridge touching on the vampire myth in the late eighteenth, very early nineteenth century. So that's the world out of which Byron and Polidori came. So the poets seem to be the avant garde. Mm -hmm. realizing you can revisit these myths and do interesting things with them. Christabel, you know, where you've got a kind of lesbian, bewitched, semi-vampire story already in the form of a poem. Um, so, so the stage was set. And I think, I mean, biographically, the whole thing with Polidori was that uh, he's getting his own back on Byron. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, it's good for literature that he was kicked around by Byron so much because it, 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 it propelled the vampire, as I said, the upward yeah. mobility, the upward social mobility of the vampire from peasant societies in Styria through to uh, the, the salons and courts and castles of, of Western Europe. Um, it was its moment, it, you know, there's romanticism. They're all playing around with revisiting the old myths only this time enjoying them rather than explaining them as superstitions. Mm -hmm. you know, whereas in the 18th century, the big thing was to explain these things away. They're, super, they're superstitious, they're, they belong to the dark ages. We've grown up, we don't believe in that stuff anymore. By the late 18th and early 19th century, they're fun. Let's do something with it, let's play with it. Let's use these metaphors for also. So the moment was right, I think, to revisit, not just vampires, but the, lots of the, the, the classical myths that have been around for a very long time. And, so you get you get the vampire in literature. Awesome. Well, everyone, uh, if you have a question during the show, put it in the put it in the Q and A box as usual. Don't put it in the chat. Put it in the Q and A box. I'll try to get them as we talk about chapter twenty seven. Um, but because we really have to talk about chapter twenty seven <laughs> today. But before I do that, I want you to tell you were awarded a knighthood for services to art and design education. Yes, not and... to vampirology, unfortunately. I wish I could tell you that I was made <laughs> yeah. to vampirology, but no, it was um, uh, art and design education, yeah. <clears throat> but you needed a coat of arms and a motto because you have to have a motto for your coat of arms. Tell yeah. us about the one you chose. Well, the motto, I, I, I wanted to, because of my interest in film and uh, 
popular culture and popular myths. I spent ages uh, discussing with the College of Heralds in London uh, what my shield, because it, when you're a knight, you know, in the Middle Ages, you were allowed to go into battle with your shield. It was like a private army and you could identify whose army you were with, uh, by which knight you were working for. And that was the, the coat of arms on the shield. And they bring out a manuscript thing that goes back to the 14th century when you, when you go and visit them. And I thought, well, I've got to include on the shield references to film. So I have sprocket holes on, on the thing. References to history. So I, have a, I, have, I have a picture of it I'm going to share while you're talking. Okay, the owl, you know, the famous quote, the owl of Minerva uh, only comes out at dusk. So you've got the owl there going diagonally and the sprocket holes. You've got the, um, the bird on the top is the dodo. And uh, they said, this is the first time a dodo has ever been chosen. It's the end of the line. Uh, the, 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 the crest of the Royal College of Art, where I worked for a very long time, was the dodo and the phoenix. They come in as a dodo, they leave as a phoenix. So there's the dodo, just about to drink his goblet of fire and turn into a phoenix. And my original plan, but this was vetoed, instead of the ribbons surrounding the crest, I wanted strips of spaghetti. Uh, to embody spaghetti westerns, which I also write about, but they thought that was a bit too much. They wouldn't um, let you get away with that, huh? I wanted Tagliatelle, and you know, but and never mind. It looks a bit like Tagliatelle. But then we get to the motto, and I wanted something that sort of tied it all together. So I got an Oxford scholar to translate for me: "Perge skelus mihi diem perficias." And um, and the, the 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 heralds read it and said, "Proceed, varlet, make my day perfect." I said, "Yeah, something like that. It's something like that." Actually, what it means is. Go ahead, punk, make my day. <laughs> it's the only Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry inspired motto in the history of heraldry. You can't take these things too seriously. I'm very pleased with it, I must say. <laughs> I love that. that is and, and also, just one final thing about the crest. You will notice it goes from slopes from right to left, which is known in heraldry as the bar sinister. It's supposed to go from left to right. Right to left is the illegitimate line. Left to right is the legitimate line. And I thought, given the illegitimacy of all my research interests, <laughs> vampires, spaghetti westerns, hammer, you name it, they're all illegitimate research interests. I'm going for the illegitimate line. So mine goes from right to left. <laughs> so it shall remain. Wow, that's just, that's <laughs> great. Um, all right, well, before we talk about chapter 27, because that's what we do here on Sundays with Dracula, we illuminate unravel disentangle bram stoker's novel about bloodsuckers in the 1890s one chapter at a time for 27 weeks and this is week 27 we did we did kind of plan to end this on stoker's birthday this was going to be the date where i had the kind of after show and we were supposed to end last week but we had a pause in the middle of this <laughs> um and and we had <laughs> and we had to go a week so i'm happy that this worked out well so we have the uh, birthday for your visit and many of you in our audience have watched every show and at the end of today that will be about 62 hours wow. um that wow. and, and if you've also watched monday drag chat um that's about 75 hours of time you put into joining me to talk about this novel so uh, you know i mean thank you isn't even doesn't even you know cover uh, how grateful I am for this. Um, Bram Stoker's notes, everyone, as you all know, Bram Stoker's notes for Dracula are one of the many gems of the Rosenbachs collection, and you can go online. You can see some of our collection guides as well as gallery gateways of past exhibitions. Our brand new exhibition on Alice Dunbar Nelson called "I Am an American" is up now. There's also podcasts that go along with that. It's a tremendously a uh, beautiful, uh, wonderful exhibition, especially at this time, uh, uh, to to uh, in our in our in our current events to to look at that exhibition, um, and you can also see other virtual programs and courses we're creating. I want to let everybody know on tomorrow evening's Drac Chat, I'm bringing back not just one, I'm bringing back five of our previous Dracophile guests. That will be Carrie Millsap Spears, Anastasia Klimchinskaya. <laughs> Holly Graves, Jennifer Hartshorn, and Rachel Amen. All of them have been on Monday Drag Chat before. They're going to return to talk about the chapter 27 with me. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure tomorrow night's Drag Chat will last longer than an hour. So I hope you'll tune in for that. But Christopher, I'm ready. Let's talk about chapter 27. Um, it begins, well, first of all, 
the last chapter, we always recap, the last chapter, the race is on, everyone. Arthur and Jonathan are in the steam launch heading up the river. Quincy and Seward are on horseback on land. Mina and Van Helsing are in a, in a, in a coach, you know, driven by horses. And they're all racing towards Castle Dracula, hoping to head him off before he gets there. And Dracula is in his box on just a pole barge on the river, just slowly going up. The Slovaks are bringing him up, and then they'll hand him off to the Sagani once they reach the shore. So, uh, and, and this chapter begins with Mina Harker's journal, 1 November. All day long, we have traveled and at a good speed. Um, and then she gives this kind of travel report. And this sounds a lot like Jonathan when, when he first, you know, comes. It's a lovely country, beauties of all imaginable kinds. And then, of course, she mentions, just like Jonathan, the people are very, very superstitious. Um, they see the scar on her forehead. They, you know, they cross themselves. And one woman puts the, the two fingers out to ward off the evil eye. I'm, it's not the peace symbol she's given her, but there's a, there's a symbol. That, I think the Leonard Wolf, he has a symbol in a, the hand gesture that people give that he looked up and the Leonard Wolf annotated. Um, and, uh, and this is really funny that she says they put an extra amount of garlic into our food. <laughs> and, and then she says that I can't buy garlic. Yeah, well, that's interesting because, of course, in folklore, the way of the prophylactic to keep the nasties at bay is garlic flour Ooh, or garlic it? bulb, not the kind that you ingest. Yeah. So she's got that slightly wrong, but it's an excuse for a gag. And what I always find slightly sad is that she doesn't notice they're being kind to her by doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, the local restaurateur is thinking, you know, they're, they're, they're off to Castle Dracula. I'm going to be really nice, but give her some garlic. It might protect her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't think that. She doesn't say, aren't they? They're, they're not. They're superstitious, but they're also very nice to me. She says, I just can't stand garlic. You know, how dare they? Or we, no, do have, we, we do have to wonder, did she like garlic before? <laughs> yes, exactly. And it begs the question of whether you can ever have a French vampire. But that's another question. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's the wrong garlic. But never mind. It's a great gag. Yeah. And then and then I love this line because then she writes, we are traveling fast. And all I can think of is the dead travel fast. And, and I wonder if if Stoker in his mind is even in thinking that the love dead it. travel fast line as he writes, we are traveling fast. Um, she's afraid to think of John. Oh, God. In the notes, one thing that uh, when he's describing this chapter, when he gets to the point of structuring the book, he keeps mentioning the word hurry. Mm. You know, we must hurry, hurry, hurry. And, and you can tell, I think, with the whole chapter that the pace is really picking up mm -hmm. um, and the sense of tension. Got to get there by the sunset. Yeah. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We're against the clock. This three prong, prong attack, one going up river, one on the bank of the river, one traveling by diligence over land. They've somehow got to converge at the same time by the sunset on, on before, before the count gets there. So you keep getting words like speed, hurry, sunset and so on and i think that that's what stoker was aiming for you know he doesn't linger in this chapter he, it moves very fast and when the action happens it happens very quickly indeed at the mm -hmm. end yeah and it, it 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 always strikes me these last i definitely the last three chapters they, they read like an author you know putting it on the page in a rush like it's this he's at this white hot rush part of finishing his novel mm -hmm. and and we see even though we have a couple chapter 26 and chapter 27, uh, you know, outlines, I always notice that he completely abandons his calendar of events that he has to keep track of. Like, like why even bother to keep track of the calendar when you're just busy writing and finishing? Yes, because in your notes, you know, the, um, the diary that he fills in day by day yeah. stops on October the 30th. Yeah. And by the time he gets to November, which is this, he just lets rip. So there, um, they're traveling quickly and uh this this also little line here in this in this verse opening here she says that van helsing um his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's yeah and a, and a real reminder too that especially for van helsing well for van helsing and the other men this is that holy crusade that yeah. they're on that the they are the conquer. circle of lights against the forces of darkness yeah, yeah they are uh, conquering this uh land by taking out the, the the by taking out dracula um november 2 i love that mina takes turns driving which is you know it, christopher we've talked about this all through how stoker keeps empowering mina 
and then seems nervous about that and has to take her power away repeatedly yeah. um, and have her, uh, you know, kind of, you know, uh, concede her power to the men even. But, yeah. but even up to the end, he still has to keep empowering, giving her things to do that women don't do in Victorian novels. Women Absolutely. don't drive, take turns driving the car. There's a particular problem with her driving, of course, because in this chapter, up until the very end, she's sort of gradually turning into a vampire herself. Mm -hmm. So she starts sleeping in the daytime. Yeah. And Van Helsing gets worried about this and she wakes up, she can't eat. She finds she can't eat normal food. Something's happening because of that strange encounter she had with Dracula. Yeah. So uh, good for Van Helsing giving her the reins because she might fall asleep at any moment <laughs> and then there'd be a disaster. So that's great that he empowers her in this way. And there's a, and there's a, uh, a note here that I'm gonna come back to later because this is a, there's a little line here that should have been cut and was not. And, and the reason becomes later. And he says, uh, she writes, there is a strange heaviness in the air that oppresses us both. Well, actually may probably shouldn't have been cut because she's describing the mood of what's going on and how they feel, but there's yeah. actually a little more going on there yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that will hit a little later. Um, and uh, to November night, um, she's, you know, what will tomorrow bring? And then she has this, she's still, she's still reinforcing this, that she is unclean, that she has been, you know, damaged in a very fundamental way by her encounter with Dracula. Um, and uh, alas, I am unclean to his eyes, his being God and shall be until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. And the increasing kind of religiosity, the increasing piety as this has gone on, as this novel has really become the Holy Crusade. Um, uh, it, it gets, it, do you find that in the novel that it, that it increases? As and, it and, uh, and I think it's quite deep with Stoker that there's a very good article by the, uh, the historian of Ireland, Roy Forster, called Protestant Magic, which is all about how a lot of the right Irish writers of Gothic fiction in the 19th century tended to belong to the Protestant elite, you know, Lefanu, Stoker, Maturin, etc. And yet they all have this sort of um, fascination with the rituals and the theology of the Catholic Church. So here you've got the symbolism of the wafer with the mark on uh, Mina's forehead. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, the increasing piety. And he argues there's a kind of jealousy by the Protestant elite in Dublin of Catholic magic. You know, they've got the rituals, they've got the theater, they've got uh, all these wonderful traditions that the, the Protestant church overthrew in the Reformation. And there's a kind of, although the Protestants are the elite, although they run Dublin Castle, that they're, they're running the society, then I'd say one thing they, they haven't got is the magic. And he, he sees that Maturin, Lefanu and Stoker are examples of this Protestant magic of, of kind of hijacking the rituals and theology of the Catholic Church, when in fact they were Anglicans or Protestants uh, mm. uh, um, and in rather an aggressive way in some ways. And I think that's a very interesting take on this in, in Dracula, because the symbolism of Catholicism runs through this story. And yet it's written by this died in the wool Protestant from Dublin Castle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have, <laughs> excuse me. Um, now we have a memorandum by uh, Van Helsing. Um, 4th November. And this is, this is two days later now. So, you know, we have to recognize too, that we haven't had an account from Mina for two days and we'll get that. We'll get the reason why here, but it, but it's uh, Van Helsing writes this to his um, friend, um, uh, John, uh, to, yeah, to Seward. And, yeah. and it's, I mean, this is a memo directed and addressed to him. And for the reason that in case I may, I may not see him, that just a reminder for the reader that this isn't a leisurely jaunt here as Mina was describing. <laughs> this is, you know, we could, we could absolutely die here. Uh, and then he gets into describing Mina. She's been so heavy of head all day, not like herself, sleeps and sleeps and sleeps, lost her appetite, make no entry in her little diary. And then he says, However, tonight she is more vif, V-I-F, this French word meaning lively or, or full of life. Her long sleep all day have refresh and restore her. For now she is all sweet and bright as ever. Um, 
And then he says, my, his power has grown less and less to hypnotize her. Mm -hmm. So Mean is undergoing the changes now. And also he's, he, and it's interesting that he describes that his power grows less and less, like, or the power to hypnotize her. But we, we talked last chapter about how there's almost this kind of battle going on between Van Helsing and Dracula to control me, at least during these, you know, yeah. these hypnotism yeah. sessions, these mesmeric sessions. Um, and also it's very important that she is susceptible to hypnotism because remember, you know, when Harker arrives at the beginning of the novel, he says, I, I want the coach for Castle Dracula, please. And they all cross themselves and don't go up to the castle at night. But these two don't want to tell anyone where they're going. They say they're worried that it'll upset the superstitious presence. So the only map they've got is her hypnotism. You know, Van Helsing has to keep yeah. saying, yeah, are we getting closer to him? And she says, swirling water, mist. Yeah. And that's not much help. I mean, I want to know which road to take for goodness yeah. sake. Uh, so it kind of matters. So when he says she's getting less susceptible, this could be a disaster. It could mean that they'll arrive late. But she wakes up here at night and they, when they reach the Borgo Pass, she says, you know, this is the way. Yep. I'll know you it. And of course I know it. Have you not, have not my Jonathan traveled it and wrote of his travel? Like, yeah. you know, well, no, but he didn't give us directions in that. Well, and also, I mean, um, possibly to do with the speed at which Stoker wrote the final chapters, the description of the journey is completely different to Harker's description. Yeah. The, uh, the Borgo Pass to the castle takes them two days in this chapter. Well, it took Har Harker a few hours. Um, when they get there, well, we'll get to the, you know, she describes the castle as being in a different part of the Carpathians. Yeah. And when she looks to the left of the castle, instead of seeing the jagged mountains, she mm -hmm. says, there's the plain. Yeah. We're in a plain, not in the mountains. So uh, Stoker should have read his own, no, he should have read his own, because when, when, when Van Helsing says, we have read Harker's description, I wish they had, because then yeah. it might resemble what he wrote. Well, this is all that, again, again, I just think he's in this, you know, white hot, you know, writing rush at, at the finish here. And, and I guess part of it is, you know, he's been working on this novel for seven years, or at least maybe he's like six and a half by this point. And it's just like, he's just pushing through to the finish. And all that care he took earlier in the novel of taking all these precise notes, he, now he's just finishing it and, yeah. and not going back to look at that. But, but I also think that, I don't know if, especially a first time reader notices any change at all, that this is just especially the way it's all presented. I, I think it, it comes across easy. It's, it's just this deep dive into it that we notice these differences. I think what comes over is the change of pace. You know, you can feel yeah. it's like the last reel of a movie. Suddenly mm -hmm. you're in the chase, you know, and uh, 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 you, you can almost get sort of, uh, you know, early Hollywood, ding, 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 yeah. You can imagine them all converging, you know, these, these three parties and everything. You definitely get that, I think, even as a kind of naive reader. That, that there's a change of gear. We're moving yeah. much, much more fast and we're moving towards a climax. Well, the sun goes down here and uh, and I love this little passage here. The find that the sun have gone down, Mad Madame Mina laugh and I turn and look at her. She's now quite awake and looks so well as I never saw her since that night at Carfax when we first enter the Count's house. Mm -hmm. I am amazed and not at ease then, but she is so bright and tend for, tender and thoughtful for me that I forget all fear. And the readers, you know, like the reader counter that knows that, uh oh, look out that housing. She's yeah. like about to bite you. Exactly, uh -oh. exactly. <laughs> but she's not there yet. She says, oh, I'm not hungry. And, but she even lies. She says that she ate already. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's, it's more than just her being uncomfortable. There is, she's clearly, there's clearly some kind of, volition here that she is attempting to deceive him yeah so by saying that she hasn't eaten so like a like a dope addict pretending they don't take it anymore yeah you know all sorts of subterfuges to put him off the scent because inside she's desperate actually and there's this kind of cosmic battle going on inside her pulling her one way vampire one way circle of light yeah so it's 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 quite moving actually to to see her being tormented in this way. And then to have him, he's he he's you know uh, a little later he says, I find her lying quiet but awake, and looking at me with bright eyes, <laughs> um, 
which uh, which absolutely remind me of, and I, and I wonder if if it's the echo in in Stoker's head of the of Poe's Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Annabelle Lee um, uh, with the bright eyes uh, in that uh, poem, yeah. and and also we've had this image we've had this imagery in this novel before about this description of someone in a kind of dying state. Well, with both you know Lucy and Mina in a dying state, and they have this kind of bright eyes and flush. And, and this all harkens back to this kind of consumptive, beautiful woman dying from the 19th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we have it again right here, I think. Um, but it's also so creepy too, that he looks yeah. over and she's staring at him with her bright eyes. And also a little bit lascivious, you know, like, like, yeah. uh, like Lucy in the cemetery. There's something kind of obviously erotic about her, which yeah. there wasn't when she was just a new woman. And he spots it a bit, but he's he's not falling for it. You know, he's he's a tiny bit naive. I mean, he knows what's going on. He should know what's he going should. on. He should. He should be you know. the rule, for goodness sake. But he kind of forgets. <laughs> um, the uh, and the sun rises, and she falls dead asleep. And then while she's asleep again, we have more of this. She looks healthy again, more healthy and more redder than before. Again, I I think this is that the resurfacing of the that beautiful consumptive look that that people would that at least poets would describe. Uh, I'm sure if, in, in real life, when people were dying of consumption, the, their family around them wasn't saying, ooh, look so beautiful right now. No, that's what poets say about know, exactly. it. So, um, and then the next morning, oh, here's where we get to the action now, because he says, let me be accurate about in everything. Um, so you know something serious has happened. Um, you may at the first think that I, Van Helsing, am mad that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves at the last have turned my brain. You know, I don't think Seward's going to think that at all. <laughs> Seward <laughs> believes what, what you're going to tell him. Exactly. But, but maybe it's another reader doing this. So um, they, they're, they're traveling and, then, and he's, and now, but, but he is, now he's consciously saying, I, I began to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. And we came across this, I don't know if it's the last chapter or the chapter before where Van Helsing even equates the land itself that they're going to as corrupt. And, and, and the Transylvania itself is a place that kind of corrupts people and leads them to evil, which certainly kind of reinforces their 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 cause to go on this holy crusade and, and it's a very colonialist way to think about a land isn't it but also i mean he got it from it you know the notes where he takes notes on uh, emily gerard's article transylvanian superstitions in the 19th century magazine and there's a quote in that article where she says you know there's a part of europe which is untouched by the wand of science and technology where every superstition in the world is there in yeah. the horseshoe of the Carpathians. And this was the Victorian view. They kind of projected onto that part of the world everything we weren't. We're progressive, we're advanced, we're industrialized, we're technological, we're scientific. They are in the dark ages in the Carpathians. So his notes led him, I, I, I think that article by, and indeed Gerard's book of which the article plays a part, The Land Beyond the Forest, is, is clear about this. It's sort of, a, it's a benighted land. Yeah. Where all the superstitions that we've grown out of still exist and that runs through dracula in a big way particularly at this point i think and an ancient land he even says in the next line as we travel on the rough road for a road of an ancient and imperfect kind there was and that that the road itself the place they're in it's ancient and but also imperfect which which i guess which which i guess also means that if it's not ancient then it's more perfect like we have we come from the civilized world where the roads yeah, are we have surfaced roads, yeah. surfaced roads and carriages and horses, and all they've got is a farm track. Yeah, and and that's you know the part of the danger and part of what they've been fighting this this whole novel. Um, and <coughs> a, a, a great little uh, then and then he's got the great little description of him citing the castle here, like like the frowning mountain. Well, actually, only partly. He says the frowning mountains seem further away, and we were near the top of a steep rising hill on summit of which was a castle as Jonathan tell of in his diary. Mm -hmm. And then, and then he wakes her up. Um, the, um, uh, and, well, he wakes her up. He tries to hypnotize her. It's too late. And then we get this and then ear the dark 
ere the great dark came upon us, which is a nice little line, for even after down sun, because <laughs> he's so grass to intentionally mangle. The first to do it in a Dutch accent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for even after down sun, the heavens reflected the gone sun on the snow, and all was for a time in great twilight. Um, mm. It's dramatic, even in this, you know, convoluted prose he's creating for Van Helsing. It's this nice kind of dramatic scene that he's setting up for. In, in the opening of the novel, we had Jonathan coming into the land, describing the countrysides, describing the superstitious people. Mm. He gets to the castle and he has an encounter with the vampire women. And now it's Mina and, and Van Helsing uh, doing the same thing. It's this nice balance in the novel. Um, and uh, the, of course, she's not hungry. She ha or, or as Van Helsing writes, she had not hunger. Um, and then he drew a big, he drew a ring so big for her comfort uh, round where Madame Mina sat and over the ring, I passed some of the wafer. You know, Van Helsing, maybe you should have did this with Lucy back in, sure. back in London. Sure. Uh, but, but he's clearly someone, I think we've established this over the, over the 27 weeks too, that Van Helsing knows a lot about folklore and vampires, but I really get from the, the, the way this is written that he seems to be learning also as he goes along that that I, I think he's often portrayed in adaptations as someone who's had all kinds of encounters with vampires and i don't think the novel reads like that i think the novel reads like this is the first time that he yeah. has encountered vampires and the way that he uses all these different levels of weaponry you know it's the the old religion uh, before Christianity, where you've got the stake and the, uh, you know, the, 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 all these kind of garlic as a prophylactic and so on, the folkloric weapons. Then you've got the weapons of Christianity, uh, the holy wafer, another Catholic reference, yeah? um, and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the crucifix and holy water and all those sort of things. And then you've got the weapons of modern science, which we'll get to a little bit later where the goodies arrive uh, armed to the teeth with all the latest weaponry and so on. So he's, if you look at Van Helsing's degrees, I'm always fascinated by, uh, you know, he's got science degrees, literary degrees, and natural history degrees. If you look at the list of uh, uh, the degrees that he got at university, mm -hmm. this guy is a kind of polymath yeah. and can get his weapons from all sorts of different worlds. On this occasion, he's got it from the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mina said, and she, he says, she sat still all the time, so still as one dead, and grew whiter and whiter till the snow was not more pale. But she's, she still clings to him. And uh, and then he says, and then he's testing it. And he says, go ahead, cross the circle, and she can't. And he exults in that because you know now though there might not though there might be danger to her body, yet her soul was safe. It's interesting uh, where the, where the notes are concerned. I think this is a very late thought by Stoker because in all his descriptions of the final chapters, there is no reference to this circle. Right up to 1896, 18, you know, it's yeah. published a year later. And there's lots of references to the other things we're talking about. Uh, you know, the, the, the mark on her forehead, the, uh, the journey, uh, the, the three prong attack and all the rest of it. But there's no reference to this circle and the holy wafer. So that came, I think, quite late in the drafting process. And it's a fairly well-known folkloric thing yeah. to draw the circle. And the magic right? circle, you know, in the occult as well, you know. The, I don't the even think it's something he needs to find in a source. This is certainly something he certainly yeah. knew from his upbringing in Ireland, hearing stories. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, uh, and, and what, a, what a gripping line here. Presently, the horses began to scream um, and just horses scream you don't want to you don't want you don't want the word scream after horses that's just no no that's Remember, an uncanny uh, thing in mel brooks's young frankenstein whenever anyone says blucher <laughs> it's that sort of feeling only more scary yeah because this is scary because this is a scream and it is and they tore at their tethers and uh the cold hour when all nature at its lowest the fire began to die the snow comes in and the snow comes in like a mist and he says um and there was a light of some kind as there ever is over snow. And it seemed as though the snow flurries and the wreaths of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments. Now we all know what this is as a reader and yeah. he's not, he's, you know, and the horses are scared, but Van Helsing's not putting it completely together. And then he says, and then he does Jonathan's hard experience um, and, and, and the snowflakes 
and the mist began to wheel and circle around till I could get as though a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he doesn't say me, which is interesting because he doesn't yeah. feel the, the, the kind of erotic threat for himself. I love this image though, all these wraiths in the mist sort of fighting yeah. to get through the circle. It's a wonderful image. You can imagine it in a 19th century illustration, you know, there's the woman, three women in white trying to, yeah. trying to break the circle. And, but are they there or is it just the mist? Is it my imagination? Yeah, it's a gorgeous image. And then the horses are moaning in terror as men do in pain. And then he describes them as these weird figures drew near and circled round. And, you know, of course we can't help but think of Macbeth, you know, the weird yeah. sisters describing them as weird figures. Yeah. Um, but Mina, sat calm and smiled at me. <laughs> That's like the creepiest smile in the book, right? <laughs> exactly. it's going on that she would smile at him. And, uh, um, but then she, she tells him, don't go out of the circle. Do not go without, here you are safe. Um, and, uh, um, and then she says, you know, oh, oh yeah. And then, she, and, and, but she says, it is for you that I fear, um, uh, you know, um, that she's, Oh, oh no, he says, it is for you that I fear. And then she laughs. Yeah. I laughed low and unreal and said in this great little speech here, fear for me? Why fear for me? None safer in all the world from them that I am. Yes. Um, I mean, I assume the circle is around Mina. He stepped into the circle, but the yeah. horses are outside the circle. Yeah. So, you know, if she's worried about him, it's because he's going to have to step outside the circle in order to get anything done at all. So, you know, but of course she doesn't have to leave the circle at all. And maybe you should have made a bigger circle. You know, come on, you could have put the horses in a circle too. Like a real big <laughs> circle. Wagons. Have protected circle you. the wagons, that's what he should have done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, the puff of wind, the red scars on her forehead that he sees. And um, the, uh, and then he, and then, uh, and then they, there were before me an actual flesh, not just the image, the misty image, but in actual flesh, the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. I knew the swaying round forms. And here we go. We're coming up to Bram yeah. Stoker's favorite word. Yeah. The bright hard eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy color, the voluptuous lips. He loves the word voluptuous, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> we should drink every time he says voluptuous, exactly. but then we would be completely drunk by the end of this chapter. So um, they smiled ever at poor dear Madam Mina. And as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her and said in those sweet tingling tones that Jonathan said were of the intolerable sweetness of the water glasses, come sister, come to us, come, come. Mm -hmm. They're not beckoning Van Helsing, which is, which is really interesting because that's the scene he's in his memory and of Jonathan that he's describing and that, I can't help but think that Stoker set this up in such a way that that Van Helsing is not only there as he's the only old guy in the group and they're all young. They're all very young, these people that are dealing with everything, but he still feels that he needs, and I think this is true, or this is a good thing, that he needs an older mentor figure. Mm -hmm. Because he's an older mentor figure, that kind of takes him out of the, the erotic equation. Um, well, yes. Also, though, she's half. Well, two reasons I think why why they want it. One, she's halfway there. She's half vampire. She's half one of us. Secondly, they are the dark sisterhood. Join us, sister. Yeah. You know, be another sister. Come on. Together, we can really do something in the castle. So Van Helsing is is a bit out of all that. I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like he doesn't even matter at yeah. this. Like they don't even care about him. The guy who's going. The guy who could easily destroy them. And and they don't even care though because they're. It's, you know, it's, and it's the vampire connection. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I like that idea a lot. And I don't even, I, I, I can't even imagine Stoker is, is intending to establish that, but that's what gets established in this scene that there is, there's a connection between vampires and they, they, you know, they, they, they want to bring her into their fold is even more important than them feeding on someone because yeah. so often vampires are just portrayed like sharks. It's just going for the food all the time. But there's something bigger here that, that they well, want to condemn to eternal life. They're lonely. It's a pretty lonely thing, you know, to be there for all eternity. And this is a this is a very Carmilla moment too, isn't it? You know. Yeah. So, no, definitely. 
the, the, the women vampires looking to establish, you know, communion relationship with the other woman. Yeah, uh, here. it's a pity in a way that from the Carmilla point of view that Mina doesn't for a moment think, yeah, I'd like to join them. That would be good, you know, if there's, there's a moment of doubt. But unfortunately, she, she's, she says, no, nope, you know. Right, the terror no. in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror. Van Helsing says, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. The Mina, Mina says, I am not voluptuous. <laughs> That's <laughs> it. not going to be voluptuous. That's it. And, uh, and, and rejects them. Um, the, uh, but Van Helsing is, and, and, and then Van Helsing pulls out the wafer um, and, and starts advancing towards them and they, and they cower, but they, ca they draw back, but then they laugh their low, hard laugh. Like they're not like, okay, we, we can't attack because you've got the wafer, the circle, but they're not even concerned still at this point. Yeah. And it's um, a bit like the laugh of the pantomime villain, you know, as he's going off. <laughs> yeah. One of those. And, um, uh, and then the horses cease to moan. Like we've, we, we've got these reminders that all the horse sounds and then finally the horses stop and lay still on the ground. The snow fell on them softly and they grew whiter. I mean, you know, and there's no more terror for the beasts, he says. No, they're dead. The horses die. The yeah. horse is dead. I think, I think we subsequently learn that, yeah. that the, 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 their hearts have given out out of the sheer terror of the moment. They're dead now. That's it. They, yeah and they uh which it, it's and it's a chilling thing i i, I just i just think it's one of the overlooked <clears throat> part you know parts of this chapter that the horse is screaming and then moaning and then they and they die and there's no violence done to them no, just sheer terror sheer yeah. terror <clears throat> so they um uh van helsing sits through the night with her desolate and afraid full of woe and terror um and then finally at the first coming of the dawn, the, the women vampires are still there. And uh, the hard figures melted into the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Um, and Mina goes to sleep and he can't wake her. <clears throat> and then and then Van Helling's just all business. Today I have much to do here. And I keep and I and I can't wait. <laughs> it's gonna be a busy day. Yeah, it's gonna, gonna be a very busy. busy day and off to it. <clears throat> well, um, right now I'm just gonna take a little mid-break to remind people of a couple of things. Um, and that is to join me tomorrow night for the final Monday Drac Chat at 6 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on the East Coast, when we'll have five of our audience Dracula files on the show to talk about the end of this novel. And also, I hope uh, Carrie and Anastasia and uh, Holly, Jennifer and Rachel, I hope you also talk about just the experience of reading Dracula over 27 weeks, as we've done. Drac Chat will likely continue next year, but it's not going to be a weekly thing. It'll probably be a monthly show that I'm going to put together just because I want to continue this um, conversation about vampires um, <clears throat> because I don't think I can go cold turkey talking about vampires, especially after after this experience. So everyone, remember to watch Monday Drac Chat. You need to register for the Zoom link. It's not the same link as Sundays with Dracula. It's for Rosenbach and Dracula Club members only. There will be no live Facebook stream, there, nor will we post it online afterwards. You can only watch it live on Zoom. And I want to remind everybody to join me for next Sunday for the very final Sundays with Dracula. We're on the last chapter today, but we're actually going to have another show and all of the co-hosts are going to come back. Tucker, Tucker Christine, Josh Hitchens, Josh O'Neill, Mary Going, and Dr. Lauren Nixon will all join me. We'll talk about this Dracula Biblio venture we've been on since May 3rd. And I'll also fill all of you in on the details about registration for our next Biblio venture, which will be Sundays with Frankenstein. Did I tell you about this, Christopher? We're oh, going to no, do this no. whole thing again with Frankenstein. And that's going to begin on January 24th. And it's going to last until May 2nd. It'll be shorter. It's about 15 meetings we'll have. Most of the meetings will be two chapters of, Dra of Frankenstein uh, in one week. Uh, I'll let you guys know where also let you guys know where we're going to go with our Dracula club community next week. Um, I'm sure many of you are going to join the Frankenstein, you know, Sundays with Frankenstein, but I also want, but 
I also know that we've 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 really bonded over this over vampires, and I want to continue bringing this kind of great vampiric content to you. And 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 there's going to be some prizes next week too. So I have something where I can give you guys some prizes for the for the last uh, after show. <clears throat> And you can also get your I Spend My Sundays with Dracula stickers. Um, let me share the, uh, the, oh, I don't have the picture up of that anymore. Um, you, uh, quantities are extremely limited. Um, you can get one with a $20 donation or more uh, at our Rosenbach Donate website. Uh, I'm sure Steve will put that link in the chat. Uh, and it's that kind of support that enables us to create more programs like this for you as I, I hope to continue into the next year. So Christopher, we, we also, at part of this, we, 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 uh, uh, we came up with a Dracula club and many of the people joined the Rosenbach as a, 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 at a discounted rate and called themselves Dracula club members. And even when we sent out the uh, Rosenbach membership cards, it says Dracula club on it, which is really cool. And everybody loved it. They were all posting pictures of their cards on, on Facebook. It was really nice. And I, I'm, I'm so it's this experience doing this to connect with an, an audience like this and to be so they're so dedicated. We've got, it says, there's 90 people right now on Zoom watching. I don't know how many people are watching on the Facebook stream. So clearly it's over 100. And it's like that every single week um, and from all over the world now too, which is nice. And uh, it is one of, the, one of the really nice things that happened during this pandemic that we were all able to connect over this novel. So, and so thank you for joining us for the last one. This is such a treat. It's good fun. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Good, um, because we got to get through the end of this chapter. And now we, and now I love this kind of jumping back and forth, like, and then the Jonathan, and then the Seward. And then, you know, like we get this rush here that happens again, that Jonathan, um, we get a little bit from Jonathan, talks about the accident to the launch and that delayed them. And, but now they're on horses and they have our, they, we have our arms. They all got their Winchesters from Quincy uh, and, and ready to, you know, uh, fight the Sagani. Um, uh, the Zagani must look out if they mean fight. So, you know, a little bravado there from Jonathan. I, I, I always chuckle when it's bravado from Jonathan and Seward. So, you know. And we have to know, I mean, he had to do this really, Chris, you know, here we are with the focus on Van Helsing and Mina, but we don't know anything about the other two parties and where they are. So you had to have a couple of lines from each of yeah. them. There's Jonathan saying, yeah, we're, we're on the boat. We got off the boat. We're getting on our horses. We're on our way. And, uh, and the other party saying, yes, yes, you know, they better watch out. So you get a sense of the three parties converging. It's very otherwise, filmic, don't you think? When they arrive, you'd know nothing about them, you know. It's very filmic, don't you think? That like oh, the film, that this idea, like the quick cut. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, and then we get Seward. Uh, no, yeah, we get Seward then. And, and they see the Sagani before them with their lighter wagon, which obviously has Dracula in that, uh, in his box. The snow starts to fall um, and they hear the howling of wolves. Um, so they're, they're on the way too. We're reminded that the other vampire hunters are on the way. Uh, and then we're back to Van Helsing and he is going to the castle. Um, By the way, Stoker would have discovered about lighter wagons from one of the books he took notes on in the Rosenbach, uh, um, Transylvania, it's people and it's products. Mm. I, uh, I think it's Charles Boner or Cross or one of those people. You, you know, the, the, the preferred cart used in this neighborhood of Transylvania is the lighter wagon. He mentions and that, so yeah. It, it's, a very, it's a technical word he had to get in. It looks terribly authentic. They've got a lighter wagon. They still he's, do, by the way, yeah. He's yeah. like that through the entire novel. We've talked about this several times of these, these kind of little details he puts in to make this a kind of hyper-realistic work for his contemporary readers, right? Yeah, exactly. It's an unusual word, lighter wagon. I've never heard of that. What is it? You know, it's clever. It stops you in your tracks. This mm -hmm. guy knows his stuff. He knows about Transylvania. Uh, actually, I don't think he did know much about Transylvania, but he gives the book. That's what authors do. So. Exactly, exactly. Research plus imagination. So, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Van Helsing leaves Mina sleeping within the circle and he, and he says, I took my way to the castle. He's got his blacksmith hammer and he's right up to the doors. And this surprises me a little bit. What, what do you think of this? Because he's got, he goes to the castle. Like, I don't understand why there isn't this great description of, mm -hmm. of Van Helsing approaching the castle. It seems very odd that Stoker leaves that be, yeah. doesn't it? 
absolutely absolutely it's all very perfunctory you know he 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 goes straight in he does his job and uh, um and he says we'll get to it but he says you know i blocked up all the entrances with holy wafer yeah well first uh, he knocks the doors off yeah. so he doesn't get shut in which is which is a really smart thing to do yeah. and then he finds his way to the chapel using jonathan's the memory of jonathan's diary which you know we know wouldn't help him but it you know yeah. that, that's Except jonathan doesn't mention a chapel Jonathan, Jonathan mentions a vault with a wooden box in it. And suddenly it's turned into a chapel with a mausoleum with the word Dracula written on it. Oh, is it? That's interesting. Different words, different words. Um, maybe, maybe Harker didn't know what a chapel was. Yeah. So he it the vault. I but it really doesn't sound like the same place that uh, Sir Harker had gone into. But there we well, are. That's, that's where he's headed. There's no mausoleum with Dracula written on it when Harker's there. There's just a wooden box. And then, and here's the line that I really think probably should have been that he probably intended the cut that he didn't. And he, because he says, it seemed as if there was some sulfurous fume. Yes, and I'm yeah. still not going to get to why that is yet. No, no, exactly. the audience. We'll get to that at the end. Um, that yeah. makes him dizzy. And there's a roaring in his ears as I, or, or I heard there's either a roaring in his ears or he hears the howl of wolves afar off, which, which I, which I love that, mm. that very, it's that sensory perception that is really bring drawing the reader into the text like, because it's an there's an immediacy uh that's part of the immediacy of this first person narration is the sensory perception too that you want to draw people in and um and he doesn't bring mina and he says uh uh he leaves her out there but but also <laughs> he says at any rate it was Leave, by leaving Mina out there, even though she's in danger from the wolf, because the wolf doesn't care about the holy circle. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, at any rate, it was only death and freedom beyond. So did I choose for her. Mm -hmm. Now, you're choosing for her. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but he right. does. And and in effect, he's he kind of says that you know, he's, he's, he's taking comfort that Mina would be better off torn apart by wolves <laughs> rather than become yeah, exactly. a vampire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and, since uh, he's half vampire, what happens afterwards? I wonder. But anyway, yeah. He looks. He looks for the vampires here, and he finds the one. And of course, she is so full of life and voluptuous. Uh, she. Uh, um, and he <laughs> shudders. And th this, to his credit, too, because he says, um, "I shudder as though I have come to do murder." Yeah. Well, you actually have come to do murder, but it's just that you are. It is a justified murder because they're evil creatures. Um, but but he really but 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 he's really affected by this and he says i he doubt that it butcher work doesn't say butcher work he yeah he yeah i'll it. say butcher work in a little while he says that uh, in old time when such things were many a man who set forth to do such a task as mine found at the last his heart fail him and then his nerve so he delay till the mere beauty and fascination of the wanton that's another word he loves wanton yeah. undead have hypnotized him and he remain on till sunset come and vampire sleep be over the beautiful he's going on and on the beautiful eyes like he's it's almost like he's seducing himself here <laughs> into yeah, into exactly. stopping um uh attacking them but he's also giving these very kind of <sighs> kind of misogynist historical reasons for you know if men weren't so you know if men weren't so seduced by these women we could have you know gotten yeah. rid of and also in, in one of the uh, 18th century vampire accounts uh written for Empress Maria Theresa. I remember this is from memory. I'm dredging this out from a long time ago. There's an example of someone who goes to stake one of these people in their grave and cut their head off and he can't do it. Hmm. He looks at this corpse and in the report it says, I just, I just can't cut the guy's head off, I'm sorry. So there's a kind of tradition of people balking at the final thing. They can't cope with the physicality of the horrible and that's thing. Not, that's not fiction. That's like a folktale account? Or? No, it's, it's a, a report by a regimental oh. surgeon to Maria Teresa about what happened in Styria. Wow. Uh, I don't think um, I remember that one. Yeah. That's fascinating. And I'm sure Stoker read that because in an interview with a journalist, I think it might even be in the Icelandic introduction that was translated by Richard Dalby. But anyway, one of the things he says, you know, that the, this is 18th century accounts of vampirism were, were useful to him, not in your notes at the Rosenbach, but mm -hmm. uh, he'd obviously read them. So I think this idea of at the last minute, you realize what it is you're doing, you're cutting a person's head off mm -hmm. and stuffing it full of garlic or whatever it is you're doing. It's not pleasant. And because they're probably full of blood like leeches, yeah. it's going to be very, very messy. 
Uh, and uh, I think Van Helsing sort of, it's not just the voluptuous, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the butcher work that's getting to it. It is, but, but, he, but, but the voluptuousness is also, he says, I was moved, I, Van Helsing, with all my purpose and my motive for hate, I was moved to a yearning for delay, which seemed yeah. to paralyze my feelings and clog my very soul. And then he hears through the snow stilled air, a long, low wail, so full of woe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion, for it was the voice of my dear Madame Mina that I heard. Mm. Did he? I mean, is this, this, this seems so strange that he would hear her because we know she's asleep and can't and, and unable to wake up apparently. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a kind of astral projection going on of some sort. Or, or, or she's so connected to these vampires because she is becoming connected to them now that she's feeling this yep. sorrow at them being destroyed. Some kind of psychic connection Psychically, is going on. Yeah. Or he's imagining it and it's a wolf, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, um, but but it's, it's just all this sensory things going on that, that makes this such a, a, a great passage. Um, and then he finds the, the, one of the other sisters, the other dark one, Mm. Um, and I dared not pause to look at her um, or I'd be enthralled. And then he finds in a great, in a high great tune, as if made to one much beloved, that other fair sister. Mm. Um, so I like that he's actually even, because we had them described with Jonathan too, and there was two dark and one was fair. Mm. Um, and they even, they, they, in that encounter, they kind of, you know, uh, they let her, the, the fair one gets to go first, I think, right? Like she seems to be in power here. And there's a hierarchy. There is. Them. And if you look closely at the notes of the Rosenbach again, um, uh, in the, 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 the first versions of the opening of the novel in Munich, he comes across this fair lady. Yeah. So when he sees her in the castle subsequently, the fair vampires, he recognizes her. I recognized her mm -hmm. in some vague way. Yeah. He's met her. And, uh, and so, and also, uh, you know, uh, Dracula's guest, there's a reference, yeah. uh, which suggests that, mm -hmm. that this fair vampire was gonna play a much bigger part at one yeah. point. Uh, and that uh, when he gets to the castle, he actually recognizes someone he's met before in a different circumstance. So she's, she's important, although she's been rather diminished in the final. Yeah, and, and then it's just another echo of that, that lost first, you know, chapter or few chapters of, of the book. But clearly by this point, he's probably, he's almost certainly discarded that as he's finishing this novel, but yet he still has in his mind, there's this greater role played by this fair one. And I, I just wonder too if there's anything we can, you know, draw from 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 the imagery about the it's the fair one that is yeah, either yeah. the is is the most important one in a sense because blonde hair wasn't necessarily you know the the, the kind of great thing in the Victorian age that it has become you know uh, afterwards uh, in in beauty culture. Um, mm -hmm. Victorians seem more to be more in love with the darker haired women. Yes, although they like pallor, pallor of skin, a fashionable yeah. pallor, you know, blue blood. You, you, you can see the veins because you don't do manual work. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> that, uh, you have fair, very, very fair skin. That's beautiful. Like that Lord Leighton picture on the front of my vampire book. Very yeah. pale, ceramic pale. That's very fashionable. Don't that's go like, out of door. That's like me over this whole shutdown here because I'm just sitting in my study up here yeah. and I don't go out. It. Don't catch the sun. Don't go out. No. Don't get color in your face. Oh, I don't want to go out. <laughs> You know, the only time we do go out, well, I go to the liquor store every now and then, but <laughs> with my family, my wife and kids, we actually go to a cemetery near here and walk around there. It's, it's a really nice cemetery that's near us and, and we get to walk around the grounds there. So my nature walks these days are all in a cemetery. Fantastic. <laughs> that's very good. Um, the, he finds them all here. And then, of course, the fair one is she was so fair to look on, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely, everyone, voluptuous. Um, the uh, uh, we, we'd be totally drink, totally drunk if we were drunk. <laughs> maybe I am already, uh, uh, but I will take a sip for that voluptuous. And then, uh, he's he's glad he heard that soul wail of my dear Madame Mina, and I nerved myself to the wild to my wild work. Um, and then he sees the tomb, the one great tomb, mm. more lordly than all the rest. Uh, and it had on it was but one word, Dracula. It's great. And it's the opening of the Hammer film, you know. The, I the, know. The, it's, I it's, can't it's, help but think of that. And the weird thing, the weird thing is Harker doesn't mention any of that. No. 
There's a wooden box on the trestle. No, is, yeah, he doesn't get him in the in this great. This is, I like this one much better. A mausoleum. It's carved in Dracula. This is this is what it should be. And especially with Dracula in all caps, mm. set aside from the text, I yeah. I absolutely hear the the James Bernard score in my head as soon as I read the word Dracula. And they squirt they squirt blood on it. You know, wonderful yeah. in the credits. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, that's the Hammer version of the film for people who who may Horror not. Horror of Dracula in, in America. Yeah, yeah you have to watch the beginning of that. Uh, at least the beginning of that with the music and then the uh, and then the tomb that says Dracula on it. Um, this then was the undead home of the King Vampire, um, and uh, and then he put some wafer in Dracula's tomb, so banished him from it, undead forever. Uh, and then he begins his terrible task and he says, I dreaded it. Uh, had it been but one, it had been easy comparative, but three to begin twice more air after I had been through a deed of horror for it was terrible with the sweet Miss Lucy. What would it have been? What would it not be with these strange ones who had survived through centuries and who had, not, had been strengthened by the passing of the years? Um, and then there's where he says it was butcher work. Oh, my friend, John, but it was butcher work. Yeah. So I, I um, and again, to his credit, because the, when they destroy Lucy, it's butcher work when they do it, but nobody, but it's not described as butcher work. It is described as like this, this hate filled destruction of, what they what they are so afraid of in, in and then, you know they describe him he was like thor the yeah. Nordic god doing this you know it's all very triumphalist first time around it, and it's also very rape like too it's like this gang rape that happens in the destruction of lucy and and here when it's van helsing alone and i think especially because he's 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 the kind of non-erotic figure of all the men then it's yeah. that it's just what it is it is yeah. just i'm butchering these vampires who look like beautiful women but clearly they're not they are they are vampires um and uh and he destroys them i'm just looking at my notes here we're getting close um the uh he's not in the frenzied passion you know like arthur was um as you said like thor mm -hmm. and and then he also invokes how he's also saving other people he says um uh the uh, well, well, first it is the um, uh, repose and the and he says the repose and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final dissolution came as realization that the soul had been won. Um, that that he sees this kind of peaceful look, and this will happen again later uh, uh, towards the end of this chapter, too. But he sees this peaceful look, gladness, he interprets it now, just of course. Second. And then they turn to dust. It's this strange, yeah. it must be a moment where they suddenly look at peace and then the decay sets in and they get to their real age, which is, you know, several centuries worth of decomposition. Is the, Yeah, it's it's hardly had my, and uh, well, that's, well, he, he plunges the stake in and, the, and they writhe and, and the blood comes out their mouth. And then he says, um, uh, hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body began to melt away and crumble into its native dust as though the death that should have come centuries agone had at last assert itself and say at once and loud, I am here. So the, um, I, I think this is the first vampire fiction that this happens in, isn't it? Do you know of any? No, no, I think it is. I think it is much used by Hammer. It's one of the great special effects of vampire movies, the uh, yeah. composition to dust before your very eyes. And, and but it's also, it's the idea that he sets forth here that that because you're finally dead, you are, you're not just dead, you, you become what you would be had you died like years ago. Like, like if you're a new vampire uh, this, by this reasoning that you won't turn to dust, you'll like Lucy, she just looks like she does dead. But if it's centuries, then you'll look like a body and centuries, which would be yeah. decayed to dust. It's a brilliant moment in the Hammer film where, where uh, when Jonathan is, is, is uh, uh, staking one of them and, you, and suddenly she, she looks like an old woman. It's quite a shock Yeah. Uh, uh, from having been voluptuous. It's, uh, yeah, voluptuous, I'm catching it. Voluptuous all over this. So yes, it's cat, voluptuousness is catching. 
yeah, yeah. That's part of the story. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm happy with voluptuous being catching. So that 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 one doesn't bother me at all. But the first but, sign of that, you got to put you back in your box. <laughs> you can't have any voluptuousness. It's bad for you. Yeah. Well, it bothers these Victorian men. It doesn't bother me now. Yeah, yeah, so. sure. Um, the um. And this is where then he fixes the entrances that never more can the count enter there undead, which is, of course, you know, that, yeah, that wouldn't happen. He's going to crop the wall anyway, right? We've already seen that. So, um, well, that's the thing. He obviously hasn't been reading Jonathan Harker's diary yeah. very attentively because he, he knows that if you block off the entrances, that's nothing. You've got to block off all the windows, you've got to block it up so you can't climb the walls. This guy can enter the castle in many different ways. He doesn't just come in through the front door, but never mind. He blocks off the entrances. Elizabeth uh, in our Elizabeth G in our, our uh, uh, audience asks, are we sure that the tomb Jonathan discovered was his tomb? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Maybe there is a vault in the castle as well as a chapel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dracula changes his bedrooms every now and again. Maybe. You know, I, you, yeah. Uh, it, 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 possible. It, it's possible. It's a big castle complex, you know, you maybe have uh, lots of these vaults and things. That's, and that's giving Stoker the benefit of the doubt. I like that. Elizabeth's giving me the, the, the Poe connection here, which I always love about the same thing happens to Valdemar in the, in the, uh, in the Poe yeah. uh, facts yeah. in the case of M. Valdemar story when he's finally released from his mesmeric trance. And he liquefies. He yeah. Liquefies, yeah, so Vincent great. Price, wonderful, yeah. It's actually one of the only, and people, it, it's true, it's one of the only really gross moments in Poe. He doesn't actually usually describe that kind of gore, which you would think he does, and he actually doesn't. Uh, except for that story that is yeah, just really yeah. gross so everybody read Valdemar the facts in the case of M Valdemar by Poe that's a really tremendously good story um the uh he uh, Van Helsing goes back to Mina uh where she's still sleeping uh and she wakes up and he says um uh um uh, come away from this awful or she says come away from this awful place um and uh she was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervor. Uh, and Van Helsing is glad to see her paleness and her illness. Oh, I'm glad you're looking very ill. Yes, um, that's it. We like pale. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah. because his mind was full of the horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. He completely missed an opportunity to say voluptuous. <laughs> um, and uh, the uh, Mina says... Um, Madam Mina tells me that uh, oh, she says she says we go east. Well, he says we go eastward to meet our friends and him, who Madam Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. So, Mina's still connected to Dracula. She knows Dracula is on his way. Um, that is, uh, uh, and she's still connected there, and they're going to go and meet meet them. So, now we're back to Mina. Uh, we get we get a a, a journal entry from her again. She's recovered in some sense i guess because he's killed the vampire women and maybe that's helped her recover some more here um this is or, or is this is the end oh no 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 because her whole account here is written obviously after everything happens because mm -hmm. it's 6 november and then she can write this account after this is it right this is mina's account this is the end of the book everybody um this is the very last journal entry we get and um, they take their way towards the east where they, where I knew Jonathan was coming. And that's interesting because she says, I know Jonathan's coming. Ben Helsing says him and where it's Dracula was coming is where she's directing them towards. Um, they, uh, here's where we get the, 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 the castle perspective that Mina describes that, uh, that, that seems wrong, right? We look back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky for we were so deep under the hill whereon it was set that the angle of perspective of the Carpathian mountains was far below it. We saw in all its grandeur perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice and with seemingly a great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on my side. Um, that's a great image, but it also means like must be like a couple miles away from it. I mean, it is, you know, to really look that imposing. Um, I mean, people have uh, tried to identify, you know, the castle. Where is it? Is it uh, Slane's castle in Scotland where he wrote part of this? Is it 
Dublin Castle? Is it uh, Bran Castle in Romania? Is it Poinari, you know, Dracula's Castle? This is a standard description of a Gothic castle. You know, yeah. you, Mrs. Radcliffe described them the same way. Uh, Horace Walpole described them the same way. They are uh, jagged silhouettes perched on top of a hill. That's what Gothic castles are. It's what um, the surrealist Andre Breton called the castle question. <laughs> Surrealists love these castles perched, tottering on the top of a tiny yeah. crag. You've got this wonderful castle that would be quite impossible to build, but it looks great. A lot like, and it's also a lot like the castle, of, uh, I can't remember its name, that they use in Nosferatu uh, and, and in the new BBC yes. Dracula. Yes, exactly. I've forgotten. Yes, that's right. That's right. Right up on the top there where it's any uh, door. You go out, How did they build it? How do they get all those stones up there? Yeah. What did they, you know, amazing. So uh, they, they, uh, they head out and then look, Madamina, look, look, and uh, they, they see them coming up through the glass. He's, he's, he's looking through a glass um, at them, uh, you know, looking glass, and you see a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart uh, from the, she says, from the men's clothes, they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. And on the cart was a great square chest. And another reminder too, because we because he never describes Dracula's boxes as coffin shaped, although they're always that, that in films. Yes, yes. And but that actually seems more reasonable because a great square chest has got to be immense. It's got to be like six by six at least. Yeah. Um, yeah. To carry, you know, Dracula, you know, laid out there, unless he's in a fetal in his. <laughs> remember, it's been in the hold of a ship, and it's been transported from the hold of a ship onto a raft up the river. And so, you know, you've got to make it look like a piece of freight. If it looks like a coffin, the Tsigani won't touch it. Yeah, but it must be enormous. Uh, yeah, the size sure, of it. Sure. And um, the uh, Mina says, uh, well, I knew that at sunset, the thing which was still then imprisoned there would take new freedom and could in any of many forms elude all pursuit. And this is the, um, uh the oh well, i'm getting close here <laughs> um yeah i i want to actually let's stop here and let's look at stoker's original outline for this chapter and then we'll also read the original thing that he had that he had written in the manuscript that he cut out but yeah. first let's look at the the chapter and actually it's uh, i'll show you um two pages here sorry i've accidentally closed a uh folder let me pull it up again here it is the first image i will show is this is just the the the, the flip side that we looked at last week and this is um this is chapter 26 and I've turned the page upside down because we have the Stratford and Philadelphia. We went on about this last week, Christopher, about uh, it's my favorite note because it's connected to Philadelphia too. So this Philadelphia it hotel. That he, he, you know, if there are occasional inconsistencies, he's writing it in hotel bedrooms, you know, on the <laughs> run in the middle of a theatrical tour. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been a long day and I'm going home at night and I'm gonna write the last chapter. So it's no wonder that sometimes the concentration slips. Or at least just stall the stationary, but um, uh, which we all do. <laughs> but what I love about this is you can really see that this is a note that has been folded, like in three here, as if he folded it and stuck it in his pocket. So this note has, has probably not not certainly, but probably had some kind of you know that he put it in his pocket perhaps, or folded it up and and it moved around with him. It wasn't as if he just wrote this on a piece of paper and then it was just preserved as a note. He likely transported it in some way just because he folded it up. And if he was just keeping it on his desk with his notes, he wouldn't need to do that. So, um, but the flip side of this is the real, you know, fun part for today. Um, the um, Arava Castle was the name of the castle in the uh, uh, thing. People uh, um, uh, wanted to uh, know what that is. Uh, or, or the, the, the castle we mentioned from Nosferatu. The, uh, so this is the flip side. This is chapter 27, and I'll make it a little bigger here. Um, and the beginning is, 
Uh, I, I have my, don't worry, I have my uh, notes to read this. Um, it's chapter 27. Mina tells um, uh, Harker at mm -hmm. sunset. Oh no, it's, it's probably Van Helsing H at yeah. sunrise and sunset when she is free of her intention to follow Drac. Um, and uh, um, that that is interesting, but that's not really what's really going to get interesting here because uh, it's, and, and, and again, remember, these plot details have been changed over time because it's first it's Quincy to go to Castle, mm -hmm. um, Art and Seward to follow to Varna and wait arrival, late follow up gypsies, Van Helsing and Mina to wait at Vistrist, assembled there, flight, meet in roadside while seeking Quincy. You know, so they had a different, he had a different approach in the beginning. He was going to send them off in different ways. And then he finally said, no, I'm going to split the forces up. You guys in the steam launch, you guys on horseback, Mina and, and Van Helsing in the carriage. That's what he went. That's what he winds up coming up with for the novel. But in the beginning, he doesn't have that. It's just Quincy goes on ahead and they all kind of meet him there. Um, but this is, this is the most fascinating part. And it starts around here. Castle in sight, sun setting. Um, and it is, um, time all important, uh, at sunset, at sunset, Drac can fly, which I love the impression that for me, I'm just like, he can suddenly fly, but it really means he can turn into a bat, obviously. Um, the, uh, uh sunset Drac can fly, um, makes stand, um, or at least we're pretty sure that's makes there. It's always so hard to figure out his, his, his handwriting. Uh, that seems like makes stand. Uh, Quincy, here it is. Quincy to rescue with Maxim gun. This is the way he's originally set this up is Quincy is going to show up with a Maxim gun. And if you don't know what a Maxim gun is, I'll share, not only will I share a picture of it, but I'll share a picture of it is that sharing? No. Uh, new share. Here we go. This is Hiram Maxim, who invented the Maxim gun. And here he is astride his Maxim gun here. It's this machine gun in which someone, actually, someone would usually feed this in. He's got it in a box here with maybe the idea that it feeds automatically. Um, and... Uh, and I love the position he is in here, astride it as if, you know, people, if you don't think that guns are symbolic of a man's penis, here's the evidence that they are. Um, this is exactly what a gun is for a man, especially a big gun. Uh, and here he is with his Maxim gun that was, you know, ready to do damage to anyone. Um, the uh, I had another picture of it here. Maybe I can't find it now. Here it is. Here's a picture of Elizabeth Fuller took at a, at a, at a, at a museum of the Maxim gun. You can see the coiled back here are the, is the ammunition for it. Uh, it's quite an impressive gun. And the idea that Quincy is going to come with the Maxim gun, clearly means he must have been on a cart with this in the back and he was ready to just mow down all of well, the you know. in uh, in spaghetti westerns <laughs> and notably ones featuring django he fires a maxim gun from the hip he doesn't need a stand he holds <laughs> this water-cooled maxim gun and just mows everyone down from the hip you know he's such a strong guy so maybe maybe quincy could carry this thing yes need to stand. maybe quincy was powerful enough to do it but anyway quincy comes in with a maxim gun right here and then it is uh in the notes it's um uh storm building up here it is storm building up that he puts in here uh sun setting uh victors hue top off of bo off box drac slain mist melts storm bursts on castle wild whirling figures of women on tower Mm. obliterated by lightning and then quincy dies as dying points as dying points to glow of red sunset hitting on mina's face uh and no stain at the very end here but the but this is certainly a lot of action um maxim gun lightning you know hitting the castle and obliterating it um 
But that's not even all of the action that he was describing at the end of this. Chris Farley's described to everybody that, that, that for Stoker, he originally conceives of this as a Michael Bay ending of, you know, of Dracula. Absolutely. Can I just say on the Maxim gun, what one neglected aspect of these final chapters is to what extent this was a, an example of Victorian techno fiction, right? Imagine yeah. sort of Stoker as Michael Crichton. You've got on the you've got the steam launch, you've got the electric lamp on the steam launch, which is a piece of new technology, which scares the peasants. You know, they, they have this electric lamp as they go up the river and everyone runs away. You've got the electric lamp, you've got Mina writing her journal on a traveler's typewriter. Mm -hmm. You've got the Winchester rifles, you've got the Maxim gun, and it's all the latest Victorian technology, mm -hmm. or the latest Vic technology of 1897 for readers. This is a piece of techno fiction as well yeah. as a gothic novel. Uh, they're using the latest weaponry to, so you may use you know, the weapons of folklore and the weapons of the Catholic church, but you also use the latest technology. And that's why the Maxim gun fits, I think. You know, yeah. I mean, Quincy ends up with a bunch of Winchesters, but equally, they're almost as much science fiction to British readers. But at the end, he decides not to use it. And then like, like this was finally the one piece of modern technology they thought, all right, this may be a little overkill and that I need to move yeah. it into something else. But he had an even bigger ending for it. Do you have the, the text for this? I do. Or? I do. Shall yeah, I read this? It or this is the uh, this is from the typescript, everyone, from the actual manuscript. It's a typescript that existed, uh, that it's in the Seattle Museum of Popular Culture. And this he then struck out and changed to the ending that we will read. But this was what was going to be the original ending after Dracula is killed. Go on to read that. And, and the first line is actually a line which is in the novel. And thereafter, it's stuff that was uh, abridged and cut out yeah. on the typescript. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sun and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. That's in the novel. Now you get, as we looked, there came a terrible convulsion of the earth so that we seemed to rock to and fro and fell to our knees. At the same moment, with a roar that seemed to shake the very heavens, the whole castle and the rock, and even the hill on which it stood, seemed to rise into the air and scatter skywards in fragments while a mighty cloud of black and yellow smoke, volume on volume, in rolling grandeur, was shot upwards with inconceivable rapidity. Then there was a stillness in nature as the echoes of that thunderous report seemed to come as with the hollow boom of a thunderclap, the long reverberating roll, which seems as though the floors of heaven shook. And then down in a mighty ruin falling, whence they rose, came the fragments that had been tossed skyward in the cataclysm. From where we stood, it seemed as though the one fierce volcano of a burst had satisfied the need of nature and that the castle and the structure of the hill had sunk again into the void. We were so appalled with the suddenness and the grandeur that we forgot to think of ourselves. And in fact, a little bit later on, um, the, uh, in, in the we'll note- that, In the note, we'll get to the note. We'll the okay. but, but the things you've mentioned, uh, uh, Edward, um, these various references that were cut to the atmosphere is getting thicker, there's dust in the air, it's all getting, it, yeah. it's feeling kind of sulfurous, the atmosphere. And there's actually a reference in the, in the typescript, Van Helsing says, I know this well-known meteorologist and seismologist, a guy yeah. from Naples, and uh, Tom, he's a great- Tom Yeri, yeah. Yeah, he's a volcanologist, and, and uh, if he were here, he'd tell us the volcano is about to go up. Yeah. So it was a really apocalyptic ending, that as Dracula gets killed, the whole- Basically, they have to alter the maps because at the top of this mountain, all that's left is a hole and a lot of stones falling down. And he and leads up to it. He, he, there's these clues that he's leading up to it. Yeah. That Nina keeps under Van Helsing mentions about the sulfur. And that one sulfur mention is left in the text that wasn't yeah, taken. At the very last minute, uh, Stoker thought, bit over the top, bit over the top. I'll cut that and, and cut most of the references that were building up to, although one of the one or two of them yeah. still remain in there, which are, uh, seem a little bit enigmatic. But no, I mean, it was a big ending because the ending, as described, is a little bit anticlimactic. Well, There's the box on the lighter wagon. We'll get, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that now because okay. th this is this is how it actually ends then, everyone. Um, uh, Van Helsing draws a circle again uh, around the rock. He had drawn a circle to keep Mina safe um, uh, because actually Dracula is coming now. And if Dracula comes, you know, Mina could easily go to him if, if there's no circle, he imagines. Um, 
They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. The snow, blinding rush of driving snow comes down. Uh, then they see, uh, she sees Quincy and John coming from the, uh, 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 from the one direction. And he says, take the glass and look. And Mina says, at the same time, I knew that Jonathan was not far off. And then she sees them, two other men riding a breakneck speed. One of mine, I was Jonathan. When I told the professor, he shouted in glee like a schoolboy. Like, I love this. It's, we're still in a boy's own adventure novel here for Stoker. Yeah, um, and then uh, he's get his, he gets his Winchester rifle. And I love this. Mina says, I got out my revolver ready to hand. So Mina's ready for action too. She is armed. Uh, the wolves, the snow's falling. I like this too. Again, there's another thing that, that reads as filmic to us now because she says, sweeping the glass all around as I could see here and there dots moving singly in twos and threes, the wolves gathering. I like this idea that that Stoker gives us sweeping the glass around. Like I, for me, I even see that in my head. I see like the image through the glass going around that she is, that focusing our attention on things that are happening as so easy to do in film. But in a novel, you've got to mention it and really pull out all those points. Um, and then they all come up. Uh, they're, uh, you know, the the um, uh, with, they're holding their weapons ready. Mina and Van Helsing. Uh, I could see that he was determined they should not pass. Um, is is Dracula and and the cart uh, halt and then halt. One was, was with Jonathan, you know, two voices shout out halt. And she says, one was Jonathan's raised in a high key of passion. The other person shouting halt was Mr. Morris strong in, in his strong, resolute tone of quiet command. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 these, both of these men have a different, you know, purpose to stop Dracula. Jonathan is a high key of passion. He is out for not only to avenge his honor, at having his wife being violated by Dracula, but it's all a, it's all vengeance for Jonathan. Still, yeah. he's getting his wife back. Yeah, and for Quincy though, he's the he's the man of action, soldier. You know, strong, resolute tone of quiet. You know, Quincy's Clint Eastwood here. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I expect you've dealt with this in in, in previous episodes. But you know, um, uh, Quincy is, I think, is a very interesting character. Remember that Stoker a couple of years before had published a western a novel called The Shoulder of Shasta, mm -hmm. which features a character called Grizzly Dick, who is the, the, the hero who has a Winchester and a Bowie knife and who uh, it behaves exactly like Quincy Morris. We um, haven't really talked about that novel and that is something um, we should have brought up. You know, it's interesting because at, at, at a certain level, Quincy turns it into a Western. Yeah. Uh, at a certain level. You know, he was originally going to be called, well, actually, originally in the notes, he's called Brutus Merix, M-A-R-I-X, which is a slightly inconceivable name, but then yeah. he becomes Quincy Adams. Yeah. I, I think um, uh, Bram Stoker Murray. was confusing him with the sixth president of the United States. Yeah. It's very, very strange. And then uh, mercifully, he changes it to Quincy Morris. Um, and, and Morris with his Bowie knife, and uh, in fact, Van Helsing said, you are all man, he says. He's a Texan. Yep. Oh, he's, yeah. He's, he's the, the, the uber Western hero. And they, so and they he, love he him no fiction. That. Techno fiction, gothic fiction, it's also a Western. I and think. Quincy brings in the Winchesters. It's Quincy that says, let's, yeah. let's, I have Winchesters, let's bring them. He arrives like the Seventh Cavalry with his Winchesters, and immediately the, uh, the gypsies uh, put up their hands and run for it. So it turns into a, a Western. It does. And, uh, and here it is battle is joined. Um, the leader of the gypsies, you know, waves the, uh, waves the back, and, and, and in a fierce voice, gave his companion somewhere to proceed. Uh, the four men raised their Winchester rifles in an unmistakable way, commanded them to stop. Um, the, uh, the leader turned to them and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. The curious thing here is that clearly <laughs> these four men with their Winchesters could just take out the whole party in one shot, but, you know... They, they don't. That would be unsporting, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah. And, um, uh, and, and, that, and if they had a Maxim gun, they might have been tempted. Yeah. So um, they don't. And instead, it's Jonathan. And it says Jonathan's impetuosity mm. and the manifest singleness of his purpose seem to overawe those in front of them, him. So he rushes into the crowd and they kind of 
let him go. Um, and he goes up to the cart. He takes the great box and flings it over the wheel to the ground, which must have been an enormous, you know, feat it of strength. It takes some doing. It takes some doing. A six foot six of solid wood square box. It's quite something to pick that up. That's the heroic moment, you know, in that adrenaline rush, the heroic moment. I don't find it that improbable, actually, especially okay. knowing what Jonathan, why Jonathan is on this mission. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then, but Quincy, unfortunately, Mr. Morris had to use force to pass through the side of the ring of Zagani. The gypsy's knives flash and they cut at him. He parries with his great Bowie knife. Um, she thinks he's, at first he's come through with safety, but then she sees he's clutching his side, blood is spurting through his fingers. Jonathan prizes off the lid with his great kukri knife. He attacked the other, and Quincy attacks the other edge frantically with his Bowie. They pull the lid off um, and the gypsies uh, who were, you know, just with Arthur and Seward pointing guns at them, they just give in. Uh, the sun was almost down on the mountaintops and the shadows of the whole group fell long upon the snow. I saw the count lying within the box upon the earth. This is Mina's perspective some of which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. So he's got dirt across him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image. And the red eyes glared with the horrible vindictive look, which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it sheer through the throat, whilst at the same moment, Mr. Morris's Bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle before our very eyes. And almost in the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I shall be glad as long as I live, that even in that moment of final dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. All right, there's a lot there. Um, mm. Surprisingly bloodless for a novel obsessed with blood um, is, is Dracula's demise. Although although it is fairly gruesome to to it would be fairly gruesome to see if you were actually watching but a knife plunging into his chest and his throat being cut probably almost in, almost decapitated it, it sounds like it has to be this is the odd thing i think about it that you know you're supposed to use a steak preferably of holy ash wood in order to dispatch a vampire this isn't a steak it's a cookery knife yeah. And that doesn't do it. That doesn't do it. I mean, that uh, Quincy may be, you know, jabbing his knife into the uh, in, in the bow knife into, into yeah. his heart, but that's not the way to get rid of a vampire. You can decapitate them and stuff their head with garlic, having staked them. But there's something odd. It, having set up all these rules mm -hmm. about staking and wooden stakes and Van Helsing describing this in detail, they don't kill him that way. Mm -mm. It, it's one of the great mysteries, you know, yeah. that plunging a knife into his heart will not do it. Uh, and so um, the decapitation will, so clearly he is being decapitated, but why did they do that? Why weren't the fearless vampire hunters armed with stakes? You know, why, why weren't they armed with the, with, with the proper weaponry in order to yeah. get this job done? It's, it's an odd moment. And, uh, and in fact, um, if I could just read one other thing, the, Go the amount that goes on in this is extraordinary. You know that when Stoker um, published Dracula, he had this reading of the, um, uh, of, of the story on the stage of the Lyceum Theatre in 1897, one morning, in order to establish theatrical copyright. And the, the manuscript of this turned up because it was sent to the Lord Chamberlain's office for censorship. And a few years ago, it's been published, you know, this is the Stoker's theatrical version of Dracula, which is basically a scissors and paste job of bits of the novel. But at the end, it finishes like this. Um, uh, and imagine, it just shows how much happens in that last few pages. Morris, Halt, brackets, horsemen fight with gypsies and Morris and Harker throw box from cart and prize it open, count scene, fades away as knives cut off his head, sunset falls, Morris is wounded and Harker holds up the head. Morris, I'm only too happy to have been of any service. Curtain. That's it. 
And yeah. I mean, in those sort of six lines, an incredible amount has happened. You know, it's the it's the last reel of a Western. You know, it's the horseman, it's the chucking the box off and all the rest of it. But interestingly, Harker holds up his head in the theatrical version. I'm not sure, does he in the novel? No. Does he, no. So that's interesting. I mean, that shows that it's a seven, that shows they've yeah. done it. And that the vampire has been slain because that's one way to kill vampires. But it's left ambiguous in the novel about, you know, they just cut his throat and stabbed him in the heart. Well, that's no good. What do you think about, back again? But but also the whole change here from originally, you know, volcanic explosion after this and all of that, that uh, and people have said this and one of our one of our uh, audience members, uh, Adam, who's a, who's who's always sending me questions. He he writes about the anticlimactic ending, he says, um, and especially that there's no real challenge from either the count or his minions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Adam wants to know what we what we think of that. What do you think of the end of Dracula here? Do you think that, that the, is this a little bit of a letdown that we don't get a real battle here, but rather just them destroying yes. him? Well, some people have speculated, I think wrongly, but they have, that, that Stoker was setting up a sequel and that, uh, you know, he didn't really, they didn't really dispatch Dracula. It, it looks as though they do, but they've got it wrong by not using a stake. And by cutting out the explosion at the castle, he, he cut out the sort of apocalyptic aspects of the ending mm -hmm. and made it rather perfunctory. And that, because um, in the notes, there's, there's a couple of, you know, you mentioned the Maxim gun, but there's one or two other, and you also mentioned the wild whirling figures of women yeah. uh, on the battlement. So at this moment, when Dracula's head is cut off, these wraiths that have appeared earlier, suddenly sort of recover from being staked by Van Helsing and appear on the battlements again as wraiths. That's very odd. You can see why, yeah. why that was cut. But it says volcano and uh, um, uh, and someone killed by wolf dash werewolf. And people have speculated maybe one of the party, maybe maybe Quincy is bitten by a werewolf. He's a hunter. He goes hunting in the Transylvania. Maybe he's bitten. Maybe they're setting up Quincy as a vampire. Anyway, that's what people have speculated, and that the perfunctoriness is 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 like the the last reel of um, you know Rocky Seven, <laughs> where you're just setting up Rocky Eight, and uh, uh, and so you're not going to explain anything because you want the audience to be hungry for the sequel. I just think Stoker ran out of time, uh, he ran out of words. Obviously, at the last minute, he was asked to cut the novel quite substantially, hence the typescript, removing lots of bits in order to fit it into the page length, the number of gathered pages Constable and Co wanted from him. I think he was against the clock, he needed the money, and I'm afraid he, by now, it's, let's get this thing over with. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this novel has lasted a long, long time. It's taken me seven years since I first had the, the first thoughts about it. Uh, come on, let's... Uh, Let's let's have a fade out ending. I think I'm afraid I think that's what was happening. But some people have speculated that he's setting up a sequel because it is super punctuary. I think it it's it's especially satisfying for me with with especially with Mina mentioning the look of peace that she sees in him, and that and that it becomes more important for Stoker in the end to to make sure he emphasizes that pity at the end that mm. that you know that they're destroying this monster and the men go in and destroy him with kind of great you know vigor and hate. And and but but Mina looks on it all as as something very different has happened. And they've actually given mercy to him. And I think if you have this giant apocalyptic ending, mm. that mercy, that pity gets lost. And also, you know, the colonists show mercy in that they don't shoot the Tsigani. You know, Dracula's palace guard yeah. looking at the Winchesters, sheath their knives and creep away. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a massacre, which it would have been if, if someone set up a water-cooled Maxim gun yeah. and it mown them all down. So the colonists are being merciful to the, the locals yeah. in very different ways, I think. And that's what, again, makes it anticlimactic. We expect quite a lot of shooting at the end and lots of bodies lying around the wagon. Not at it's, all. It's anticlimactic in a good way, in a way that yeah, I think, yeah. you know, is, yeah. is, is a very positive sign is the way that, that it ends. And yeah, yeah. The, the, the Westerners bring out the technology and yeah. the Easterners run for it. Yeah, the um. So, but they do. They go away. The the gypsies just go away. It says they take their way off, and the wolves kind of the wolves followed in their wake. So maybe they're not going to survive. Yeah, it's it's made, made a bit like the wild bunch. You know, they disappear, yeah. and then we realize they've all been they've all been done in off screen. And then for Mina, it is the holy circle did not now keep me back. That mm -hmm. she's free. Um. Mm -hmm. Uh. And uh. And then. Uh, but but it's Quincy now that they go to and um, 
because uh, uh, Quincy's been wounded and, and uh, he says, uh, I am only too happy to have been any been of any service. Oh God, he cried. It was worth for this to die. Look, look. And as the sun's coming down, they see that the mark on Mina's forehead, which these men have been obsessing over since it happened. The men, it's, I was talking about it in previous chapters. It's the men who kind of keep saying, oh, and that mark on your head. Um, so they're the ones obsessed with the mark and it goes and it's gone. Um, the dying man spoke. Now, God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away and our hero Quincy dies. And because uh, he isn't Clint Eastwood, that's more lines than Clint Eastwood's ever spoken in his entire career. Or, or indeed Gary Cooper, who just said, yep, uh, this is quite a long speech. This is, this is someone on the stage of the Lyceum uh, really giving them their money's worth as, as he does his dying speech. And uh, he's died for Mina. And that's yeah. what he says. He says, I didn't die to save the world from this evil. He, it's, it's all for the woman. And that'll get reinforced again here as well, even at the end of this note that follows because then there's a note yep seven years ago we all went through the flames which has actually changed from the typescript typescript said 11 years yeah exactly actually changed that it's uh, for some reason uh and it, and it drives people crazy trying to date the novel <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly exactly you know? so um and then this curious line and the happiness of some of us since then is we think well worth the pain we endured the happiness of some of us. Well, that could be a reference to Quincy. They lost someone. Yeah. Not everyone's happy. I mean, he's dead. But it's but it's since then. So yeah, it's no, like some no. of us since then. And no. he changes it because in the in the in the mm. in the typescript it said all of us. And he crossed that all and wrote some. Yeah. As if as if some of them certainly maybe we're not happy after this. Maybe, maybe the Harker marriage isn't working out quite as well as they hoped. He's clearly maybe. hinting at something. It's not a pure happy ending just by that tiny little word. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's their, their boy's birthday is, is the same day as that on which Quincy Morris died and also the day Dracula died. So it's not just happy birthday, you know, you know or, or, or it's, it's also, it's a, today, November 8th is, is Stoker's birthday, but November 6th is actually Quincy's birthday or the child's birthday. Um, and Dracula died. Sequel, anyone? Yeah, yeah. The and, the bundle, died. Da, 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 dum. and the bundle of names that linked our little band together. That's who they named, like he has everyone's name, right? So where's his yeah, name? It's pretty weird. It's, his name's Quincy John, Jonathan Abraham, Arthur Harker. <laughs> I mean, that's saddling the boy with, with although they call me Quincy. And they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it's interesting, in the summer of this year, we made a journey to Transylvania and went over the old ground, which was and is to us so full of vivid and terrible memories. And then here's a line that he, that he didn't cut out, but should have been. He says, every trace of all that had been was blotted out. Mm -hmm. And then the castle stood as before. Clearly that line about everything blotted out was supposed to be taken out. Can I read the bit that would have gone in there? Go on, for it. On, on the manuscript. The site of the castle was a desert waste where as yet no seed could flourish, and whence came no bird or insect or even a crawling thing. It's cold, furious, silent loneliness uh, was uh, a scene, an abomination of desolation. And it always reminds me of Chernobyl. You know, this idea that, you know, birds don't sing anymore, insects aren't there. You've got this complete wasteland. Yeah. It's, it's a shunned territory. Yeah. Something has happened that's so extreme geologically that nothing will grow there again. It's a very potent image, an yeah. abomination of desolation. It's very Old Testament, you know, the language at that point. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that had to go. Uh, and instead, we got every trace of all that had been there was blotted out. Uh, which is which could just mean it's blotted out from our memories yeah. and it's not a specific reference to the castle but it's but a really castle still there he says the castle stood as before reared high above a waste yeah. of desolation and that, and that you know that that uh, castle dracula is now a shunned area of the world where nothing organic will grow anymore i think that's mm -hmm. such a strong idea you know like chernobyl or like some cataclysm that's happened and that uh, you know, nature is stopped in its course, an abomination of desolate, a very biblical kind of ending. And uh, I'm sorry he lost that, actually. I, I, I like that as a punchline. Mm -hmm. Well, they, um, 
They're struck by the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed, which we've all just read, there's hardly one authentic document, nothing but a massive typewriting, except the later notebooks of Mina and Seward and myself and Van Helsing's memorandum. Who would believe this, right? <laughs> and Van Helsing gets the, the last line here. Uh, we want no proofs. We ask none to believe us. This boy will someday know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on, he will understand how some men so loved her that they did dare much for her sake. Jonathan Harker ends. Um, so it's all just a chivalric adventure to save Mina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The damsel in distress, the, the knights in shining armor have ridden to the rescue at Camelot with the castle on the hill to save the damsel in distress. Yes. There's a bit of that. Only they've got Winchesters and- Yeah, and, and Bowie and, knives and kukri yeah, exactly. knives. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, everyone, we did it. Um, <laughs> you do a little dance here that we got through 27 weeks, a chapter of a t at a time of this. Um, Christopher, uh, closing thoughts on this final note here at the end of the novel? Well, again, people have read that maybe he's uh, trailing a sequel of some sort. Uh, I don't he think had 15 he, years to write a sequel and he didn't do it. He wrote other books. Stoker instead, wasn't a so. sequel man. He, 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 he moved on to do Miss Betty, an 18th century thing, and all these other books. You know, he, he kept going. But no, I think it's, it's, it's a nice ending because, you know, this tradition of uh, horror novel, which Wilkie Collins in The Woman in White <laughs> revived, of Gothic novels being a collage of documents. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, which he'd made fashionable again, which had been very fashionable in the 18th century, you know, that it was, it was quite commonplace at the beginning of a Gothic novel to say, this is a manuscript that was found in a leaky vault and I've, I've blown the dust off it and uh, I didn't write it, or even Henry James, you know, at the beginning of the turn of the screw, telling a ghost story session and somebody says, I heard quite a good one the other day about a friend of mine. Uh, I, I, I leave you to believe what you want to be. And he, he revives that tradition of the collage of documents but as many people have said, there's one document that's missing. There's one very important, Dracula never gets a document. Yeah. We never hear the point of view of the other. You hear the point of view of the circle of light and they're all reinforcing each other and supporting each other. And uh, you know, the, 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 uh, off they go to, to fight their crusade in the land beyond the forest. But Drac doesn't get a say. If this was a court, there's no, you know, the, 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 wit the, the key witness isn't called. What would he say about this? Is that one of the reasons you think why adaptations are so ripe, like, or so, you know, that the, there are so many is because it leaves that, that piece untold? Yeah, and I think the collage concept means that it, it, it's like a, a, a mosaic of different perspectives. So you can, you can slice this story in lots of different ways. And, and I think that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why it's resonated for so long. I mean, the other, of course, is that you know, it's such a potent myth that each generation can remake to embody the anxieties of different ages, you know. So, you know, you can set it in a high school with Buffy. Uh, you, can, you can set it in, a, in, in small town America in Salem's Lot. You can set it anywhere, but the metaphor is so strong, or indeed you can, you can turn the vamp, you can, you can look at the inner life of the vampire in Lestat, uh, Anne Rice, you know, actually give give the vampire a psychology for the first time. We when also I'm had well, we also had Barney the Vampire, you know, forty years before. I mean, he, yeah. he does that as well in that that Reimer does that with Barney as a kind of addict. You know, he, yeah. he has to have his fix and all the rest of it, and and um, unwilling, like he doesn't want to be a vampire, and in the end destroys himself. I mean, it works brilliantly. I mean, let me give you an example, a small example. Uh, I I did a seminar all about vampire films with my students at the Royal College of Art. They 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 weren't frightened by the vampire, they were frightened of the fact that he was a carnivore and they're all vegetarians. <laughs> and they said, oh God, he eats flesh, yuck. Yeah. Now, you know, that's an aspect of it that didn't occur to Stoker, but it, it gives it a particular punch today. Vegans don't like vampires very much. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it, the thing keeps alive, depending on the anxieties of the moment, you yeah. can rewrite this story. Um, and, and of course, Coppola, when he made Dracula, completely reverses it. Van Helsing is a crazed fundamentalist. You know, we, we strike for the Lord, says Anthony Hopkins with his cross as he walks forward, like some crazy fundamentalist. And Dracula is the last romantic. 
love that crosses the ages going back to the middle he completely reverses the poles of the story and yet you can still tell it so this is a very flexible like like all the best myths yeah. it's flexible yeah. enough to fit the experience so which is why a hundred and something years later it still fits the anxieties and the experiences we're now interested in me too dominance dependence consent drugs i don't know you name it yeah. the plague for goodness sake the plague one vampire bites two bites four bites eight you've got a pandemic you know i mean this this is such a resonant metaphor you can you can actually make it fit all sorts of contemporary experiences and this I'm happens not... this happens throughout the 19th century too right with with frankenstein with with jekyll and hyde now with dracula with, with dorian gray with island of dr moreau these kind of myths mythic monsters that we still tell stories about and adapt over 100 years later yeah I, I i often wonder what it is about the 19th century that did this you know so yeah yeah now when i when i was um talking about frankenstein and i don't know who came up with the with the line but it's uh, it's it's a very good it might have been david skull actually but anyway uh that that uh forget about adam and eve in the garden of eden the real creation myth for modern times is frankenstein yeah it's about uh test tube babies as we used to call them it's about a, a scientific birth a technological birth and this is the the metaphor for the modern era of birth so frankenstein becomes the new creation myth well in the same way dracula is the myth of unbalanced relationships yeah. of various kinds you know and uh no it's long may it live it'll be here for many hundreds of years to come well Cookery knife and bowie yeah. knife forget it forget it uh, this guy is going to come back and and people in our audience, I did not ask Christopher to do that segue into our next adventure, which will be <laughs> Frankenstein. But it just it naturally happens, and that's one of the reasons we're going to do it next. Um, and and in uh, fact, you know, in in, in 1826, uh, a visiting dignitary for, uh, visited London and went to one of the London theatres and saw the first horror double bill in history. 1826, the vampire coupled with Frankenstein. Yeah. We an have adaptation a of Polidori and an adaptation of Mary Shelley. So we now have a playbill at the uh, at the Rosenbeck that we just inquired uh, last year, the year before, very recently. That it is uh, it's a playbill for presumption, the Frankenstein yep. play, and at the bottom of it, it says like and coming up this week kind of thing is the vampire. Right. So right. you know, like on they've on been the together stage. since the eighteen twenties, yeah. so uh, they're still together. Well, Draculophiles, we did it. We talked about each chapter of Dracula from May 3rd when the novel began to today, just two days after the novel ended on November 6th. And we managed to finish on Stoker's birthday with Sir Christopher Frayling. I call that a big success for a program. Uh, Christopher, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to annotate this last chapter with us. And I also have to thank Les Klinger because he connected us because Les knows everyone. Yeah. And, and I got to go to Les now for Frankenstein connections too. But I hope you'll consider coming back and being a special. Yeah, I'd be delighted. Guy. I'd be delighted because, you know, you mentioned I did the book a couple of years ago. Yeah, which I have in the other room. Like I have that book too. That's, that's just the Frankenstein subtitle. books. <laughs> cheeky subtitle, The First 200 Years. Yes. So there are many more that. to come. But yeah, yeah, I'd be delighted. delighted. Good. And you're welcome at the Rosenbach anytime. So when this pandemic ends, you should come by and visit us. And we'll have a cocktail together to, to toast Bram Stoker and his birthday. Excellent. So Stoker and, syrup special. Yes. So because I've had since I started the Rosenbach, we've had a Stoker birthday vampire celebration every year. So um, I would uh, definitely continue that. Um, thanks, Steve, for being our chat Renfield today. Steve, I thank you for every week that you've done this. I really appreciate it. And Dracophiles, thanks for tuning in today. This recording, of course, will be posted on our website. And if that's how you're watching right now, thank you for watching it. We have a Sundays with Dracula Facebook group. If you're very new, if you're maybe you're watching this show for the first time, go on Facebook, find our, our Facebook group where we continue the conversation. Uh, I'm also always available to answer anybody's questions via email. I encourage anyone, if you're going to drink, Try some spirits from Tamworth Distilling and Art in the Age. I am loving the drinks that they have come. They will return for Sundays with Frankenstein, and they were they're going to help me concoct the Frankenstein cocktails for the run of that show as well. Uh, don't forget, everyone, to join me tomorrow night for the final Monday Drac chat of the year with Dracophiles Carrie, Anastasia, Holly, Jennifer, and Rachel. 
and next week in our special Sundays with Dracula wrap up show. Same time uh, with all the co-hosts returning, Tucker, Christine, uh, Josh Hitchens, Josh O'Neill and the ghoul guides, uh, Dr. Lauren Nixon and Mary going. Uh, so don't wait, miss next week. I'll have a lot of fun talking about the book, our experience during this whole Biblio venture. And I'll have news about the next about registration for the next one, the Sundays with Frankenstein and our prizes. So join me again for one more week. Uh, once again, Christopher, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks everybody. Wine. I do, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to imitate Bela Lugosi, but it didn't quite come off. That's okay. I'm drinking champagne today and I oh, do drink champagne. So thank you for having me. See thank you next you. time. All right, everyone. Once again, we'll play, be played out by Tucker Christine's Pleated Gazelle song, Storm into Whitby. Farewell, everyone. And in the words of our friend Dracula, go safely and leave something of the happiness you bring. Farewell. Farewell.